everybody. Uh, welcome to the Transportation Commission meeting of uh, February 16th, 2023. Let's call the uh, commission to order and have a roll call, please. Director Olgin. Here. Director Adams. Here. Director Stewart. Here. Director Brackey. Here. Here. Commissioner Vasquez. Here. Commissioner Hall. Is here. Yeah. Commissioner Garcia here. Commissioner Hickey here. Commissioner Hart here. Vice Chair Beatty here. Chair Stanton here. And we have no public comments today, so let's go to comments of individual commissioners. And I see Commissioner Hickey on the screen. If you would please start, we'll do the Zoom people first. Yes, sir. Good morning, Chair Stanton, Vice Chair Beatty and Commission and all of our participants today. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> I wanted to tell you about a town meeting that I attended on February 4th. It was a Saturday in Bailey, Colorado. And it was host, it was gathered by Speaker McCluskey and Senator Baisley to talk about uh, Highway 285 and the concerns of all the residents along that road related to traffic, driver behavior, truck uh, volumes, and especially, you know, the Fridays and Sunday afternoon backups, which make it really unsafe. So we had presentations by Region 2 RTD Shane Ferguson and Jason Nelson from Region 2. They did an excellent job talking about what is being done by CDOT as part of our 10-year plan, including the Highway 9 and Highway 285 interchange improvements and rebuild plan for fair play. That's going to start this year, yay, as well as surface improvements that are going on, and I say that's gonna start this year, I mean they're uh, finally um, chosen, I think the bids, and so the funding is going to be in place, design is going to be in place, and um, there will be surface improvements going on uh, in the area, but in and around Bailey, we had probably 75 people show up and provide really good questions and input about what to do. Certainly we all have grand ideas about how to improve safety, a lot of which is of course driver behavior, including those truckers. Um, but also they had some really good um, practical improvements like painting different stripes in different areas and things that we could accomplish in a short term. So we really appreciated that output, uh, that input and um, turnout at that meeting. In um, the local uh, PPACG area, I just wanted to note the MAMSIP projects making good uh, progress. <clears throat> and also we, the City Council of Colorado Springs just passed new zoning regulations. And those were influenced in small part by our GHG rules. I know that they were very conscious of those emission reduction rules when thinking about land use improvements, which could uh, incentivize building around transit routes, for example, and change some parking requirements as a result. So I thought that that was a positive example of locals uh, putting their heads together to serve local needs in the way they want to do so on a voluntary basis, but it reflected that statewide policy initiative. So that's all I'll say for today. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Hickey. Let's go to Commissioner Hart, followed by Commissioner Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be short uh, today. First of all, I uh, I want to uh, express my heartfelt thanks for all of the uh, uh, CDOT crew uh, working uh, under John Lorme uh, that have been out during this storm and all the storms that we've had this season and past seasons and will be in, in future. And uh, it, it's one of the first things that you do is you see that the the weather is turning bad, and, and our typical thought is, is, gosh, I really don't want to go out on the road. 
uh well our crew that's their job to get out there and they do a fantastic job working uh 24 7 to make sure that these roads are open and clean and safe for us so my hat's off to them I just think they do a spectacular job and uh the state of Colorado is just very very grateful for the hard work that they do uh secondly I just wanted to note that I thought that the workshops that we did yesterday uh, were really well done um I particularly uh you know obviously I always enjoy hearing as much as I can about the budget to make sure that we're totally understanding all the elements of the budget, what we are currently doing, what we're planning on doing in the future. So I thought that um, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, but then in also particular, the uh, presentation on the status of our interstates, particularly the, that portion of our interstates that are in poor shape and what we're trying to do about it, not just to um, make sure that we're tackling the problem areas, but identifying long-term solutions so that we don't uh, uh, have this issue come up uh, in the future again. I thought that was an excellent presentation. Uh, the fiber presentation, uh, a lot of us talked yesterday about that. Superb. It's obvious that that's an area that uh, the entire state uh, is needing to work on and is working on and uh, is critical for all of Colorado, and it's extremely critical for rural Colorado and using the backbone of uh, the, the uh, CDOT system uh, to assist with the middle mile connections that are going on in the community. So thought that was wonderful. And then also the Office of Innovative Mobility, uh, the work that is going on in that office, I think is, is just absolutely wonderful. My hat's off to the commissioners that are on that committee uh, that are providing the leadership. And it is definitely showing us the future and watching the progress as we evolve is a fascinating process. And I, uh, I hope that all of us continue to keep our, our uh, sleeves rolled up and continue to work that area well. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Hart. Let's go to Commissioner Adams, followed by Commissioner Stewart. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, listen, I'd like to, uh, as, as is my practice, I'd like to thank all of the dedicated CDOT staff working in the uh, in the field to keep our roads safe, and uh, like to thank the headquarters uh, staff as well for all the work they do in planning and preparing for the future of uh, low em uh, emissions and other uh, technology that we need to bring to uh, bring to the citizens of Colorado. I'd like to especially thank all of our African-American employees within CDOT and all of our partners, uh, in particular with, <clears throat> with respect to Black History Month. And I'd also like to do, uh, I guess I'd like to identify one African-American historian that I'm not sure everyone knows about, and that's Mr. Garrett Morgan. And Garrett Morgan uh, became known as the father of transportation technology due to his innovative contributions to the industry. In 1923, when automobiles were still relatively new and accidents were abundant, Morgan invented the traffic signal. The idea came to him after he witnessed a fatal accident between a car and a horse grown trolley that unfortunately ended a young girl's life. Traffic lights are still used today and have, have made roads all across America um, much safer. And it's particularly important, I think, that uh, in light of some, uh, some things that are being done around the country to limit our knowledge and awareness of African American history and other things in terms of courses that are being taught, I think it is particularly interesting and important that we try and highlight some of the contributions made by some of our African American citizens, particularly during Black History Month. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will stop. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And let's go to Commissioner Stewart, followed by Commissioner Brackey. Thank you very much, Chair. I echo um, everything that's been said about the importance of our um, professional staff at CDOT and the work that they do during this difficult winter time. Um, wanted to mention that um, I appreciate uh, the work that um, Region 1 is doing on the I-25 Segment 2 um, safety and transit analysis uh, that um, we all had a bus tour last year that was 
um, a good highlight of some of the challenges along I-25, particularly segment two. And as that moves forward into another meeting later today, I really appreciate the momentum on that and the work that's being done and, and, and look for um, some um, important uh, movement forward on that segment two um, as our professional staff work on that. Really appreciate that. Uh, that tour that we had last year was really, um, an important one in that it allowed us to physically see some of the impacts and challenges and also progress on I-25. And uh, some people that went on that tour, elected officials also serve on Colorado 7 um, Coalition and they have asked for a tour now um, of which um, Commissioner Brackey and I are working on uh, jointly again. Uh, to provide a tour from Boulder to Brighton. This is a little different tour. This one is really to look at what um, the what that corridor looks like and where each community is involved. And so I want to thank um, Region 1 and Region 4 for collaborating on that. I think our tour will be in, in April. So I really appreciate that. And finally, I want to thank Jennifer Phillips of Department of Transit and Rail, who is a new a new uh, person at Department of Transit and Rail. And uh, she met virtually with a couple of us um, on the I-25 corridor um, and will be coming to the North Area Transportation Alliance in the near future to talk about um, CDOT and Department of Transit and Rail's plans to do mobility hubs every 10 miles and how that impacts um, I-25 in places that those mobility hubs are going in and also in places where those mobility hubs aren't aren't uh, ripe yet uh, to make the improvements that need to happen there that will accommodate multimodal options, um, something that we've all um, supported on the I-25 corridor in order to uh, meet greenhouse gas um, reduction efforts. So thank you to everyone involved in that. And that's my report. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks, Commissioner Stewart. Commissioner Brackey, followed by Commissioner Hall. Great. Good morning, Chair and Vice Chair and, and fellow commissioners and all who are participating this morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share a few remarks. Um, again, I, I agree and share the comments uh, from the, my fellow commissioners around just the incredible work that's being done by CDOT staff across the state. Um, in all the regions at headquarters. It's really impressive uh, to see. And um, I also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Heather Paddock and her team in Region 4 for all of their continued work on I-25, the work that's underway now on construction, as well as getting um, moving forward with a, a Segment 5. So lots of exciting things um, continuing to happen there. And again, that um, collaboration with uh, Region 1 and Region 4 and Region 4 on all of the North I-25 corridor. Um, some of the highlights from the past month that, that I wanted to share was that I had a, the opportunity to attend the Bicycle Colorado Moving People Forward uh, conference that was held in uh, Denver a few weeks ago. And it was really an amazing um, coming together of people from across the state to talk about not only um, uh, bicycle commuting and transportation, but also transit, safety, and a whole variety of other multimodal transportation topics. And I want to give a, a shout out to several of CDOT employees who participated on the panels for that event. Uh, Amber Blake from CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail did a fantastic job pre presenting on the transit panel. Uh, also, Marsha Nelson did a, a phenomenal job presenting as part of the uh, equity panel uh, as, that was part of the plenary session. So really incredible to see the leadership and the staff uh, work at CDOT being shared with uh, stakeholders across uh, the state. Um, Bicycle Colorado also did a great um, acknowledgement of Rebecca White and all of her work that she's contributed to uh, CDOT. And it was really great to see her get that, um, that recognition. Um, in addition to uh, that event, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, CDOT uh, four chair uh, uh, TPR meeting with the North Front Range MPO, the Upper Front Range and Eastern, uh, along with uh, Vice Chair Beatty and uh, Commissioner Stewart. And again, it's a great opportunity to come together and talk about the interconnected transportation needs of Northern Colorado uh, in all of the different areas that, that we serve. And then uh, lastly, I want to uh, just give a um, 
acknowledgement for a meeting I attended earlier this week in Estes Park with the uh, Town Board of Trustees and work that they're doing in collaboration with the North Front Range MPO and others to look at the US 34 corridor. And they're forming a corridor coalition that extends all the way from Estes Park um, out to Sterling and looking at the um, transit and mobility needs along the corridor and then other segments of the corridor looking at more of the infrastructure needs. But it's a really great example of that um, interagency collaboration among uh, the communities along the corridor and looking at how connections can be made. There's a lot of interest in the formation of a new transportation management organization that would help bring together both the public sector and private sector to serve the US 34 uh, corridor and help advance the needs there. Um, and then also a lot of interest in the future possibilities of busting or Pegasus type service along US 34 um, to connect the, um, the jobs in the Estes Park area, jobs all along the corridor um, with the um, housing areas that are located more along the front range. So again, a lot of the conversations we're having around that intersection of affordable housing and transit and transportation certainly are playing out here in Northern Colorado. So um, I, exciting work that's happening. And again, I appreciate um, CDOT's involvement, engagement and all of those things. So uh, that's my update for this month. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brackey. Commissioner Hall, followed by Commissioner Garcia. Good morning and uh, thank you, Chair Stanton. And uh, good morning to all of you. Wish I was there in the room with you. Uh, I would just like to make a couple of brief comments. I really appreciated all of the commissioner's support and the staff support on the ITS fiber program. Uh, as we talked about, that's so important for economic development for rural Colorado. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult program to, to do in the rural areas. And I appreciate the support from the commissioners from yesterday. Also really appreciated the, the poor interstate pavement uh, conversation and and the desire to get that fixed. We all uh, really, we re, none of us like to hear the fact when they pull into Colorado, you can always tell because of the roads and we really appreciate the attention to that issue yesterday. Um, and of course, a shout out and, and uh, to all of the staff and, and but I want to especially, we've had such an amazing snow year, uh, which is wonderful for the water content, but difficult for John Lormay and his group. But I'd like to especially thank John Lermay and, and Jason Smith. We've had some really bizarre uh, truck accidents in the canyon this year. And I'm sure you've seen the pictures. The pictures, I think, are, are just like things we haven't seen before with the way the trucks are hitting those slick areas and, and going down. And so I know they, they're under a lot of pressure all the time over, you know, keeping that canyon open and they're doing the very best they can under some some tough situations. And I think we'll figure out a solution on that. But uh, just thank you to them for doing everything they can under really tough circumstances of keeping that canyon open. Thank you, Chair Stanton. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Garcia followed by Commissioner Vesquez. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Chair Stanton. Uh, the last month has been uh, pr pretty busy with uh, work on broadband. I attended the uh, Crested Butte uh, broadband workshop put on by Region 10, thanks to Herman uh, allowing me to attend with my CDOT hat on. It was very informative. Uh, we had a great presentation yesterday with uh, staff providing some information on broadband as well. And I look forward to working with with staff and with my fellow commissioners on this effort moving forward. I appreciate the support on it. I think it's it's much needed in our particular part of the state as well as in rural Colorado. Uh, I would like to also echo everyone else's comments about CDOT staff and their work on keeping our roads safe and plowed. I came over Wolf Creek on the way over to this meeting and uh, it, was, it was maintained well and it's uh, indicative of the effort that continues up on Wolf Creek. I think they got 29 inches out of this last storm, according to the Wolf Creek ski report. So uh, measurable snow up there. Good job, uh, team working on that. Uh, attended a TPR meeting in, in the Southwest TPR and uh, just continue to be active in my region on transportation issues. And um, I'm ready for the beach. I don't know about you all, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner Garcia. Commissioner Vasquez. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to take the opportunity as co-chair of the Advanced Mobility Committee, which works closely with Kay Kelly and her team in the Office of Innovative Mobility, just to review a little bit what we heard yesterday from Kay and uh, Mike King on the electrification update. And this is primarily for people who are uh, on Zoom today or might be watching uh, after the fact on YouTube uh, to review where we've come in the last couple of years. Um, I've also served on the, the agency coordination committee with um, Commissioner Hickey and Commissioner Stewart uh, on the greenhouse gas emission reduction. And these two things tie together so closely as we watch how we're moving forward to achieve the goals set by the Colorado Energy Office um, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Roadmap. We have a goal uh, that is assumed in our plan of targeting over 900,000 EVs on the road in Colorado. Uh, Mike's update, you can view um, from yesterday's workshop. We hit uh, over 10% of new vehicle sales as EVs and uh, we have over 70,000 registered. Now there's a big gap between 70,000 and 900,000. We can all see that. It's assuming um, uh, an accelerated uh, adoption of EVs over the next few years, but so much of the infrastructure uh, that was impeding uh, faster adoption has been addressed. Uh, many more EVs to choose from, a very uh, generous federal uh, tax credit as well as a state tax credit, um, as well as great work on putting together the infrastructure for public charging. And you can see all that in Mike's update. We have uh, over 73% of the state highways have a, a, a fast charging infrastructure within 30 miles. But most importantly uh, is this education and outreach that was reviewed by Mike. You can go to evco.colorado.gov um, and get a lot of information. I've talked to a lot of people about uh, purchasing uh, an electric vehicle. There's been hesitation based on range anxiety, uh, charging infrastructure, um, the uh, dealer support for owning a, an EV, and so many of those things have been knocked down one at a time. You can go to that website, learn a lot more about EVs if that's something you're interested in. And then finally, um, he reviewed an update on local training for the workforce, which is a very important component. So hats off to OIM, as well as to the team, Rebecca White and Teresa Taguchi and others who've worked with the greenhouse gas reduction effort within CDOT. These things are coming together to help Colorado meet its goals uh, in terms of emission reduction. And with that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vasquez. Commissioner Holgin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Um, another busy month. Um, at the end of January, I attended a design lab that was focused on people-centered streets. Thank you, CDOT, for uh, organizing that and uh, engaging local key stakeholders. Um, it was a fun session. It was a great opportunity to practice how we look at a challenge and develop low budget solutions. Um, in this case, it was brainstorming a very complex uh, intersection between Colorado Boulevard, Leedsdale, Bayard. Um, and the whole point was to look at how we improve pedestrian uh, access, uh, how to improve critical bike route connect connectivity uh, without increasing commute times and without increasing traffic to the neighborhood. So um, it was really fun to engage with our local partners and think about um, a lot of ideas. Some of the ideas were just not possible, but that sparked other ideas. And so um, Ultimately, I think this was a really good space to come together with our local partners and think through what what broad what areas can we look at that can be or strategies that can be broadly applied um, that can be quick and expensive that we can learn from them. Then try it again. Um, so, Shin, is that um, at the 
non-attainment area air pollution mitigation enterprise. We had a wonderful presentation this last month by um, Simon Logan, who talked about the equity, the um, Central 70 tolling equity project. Um, the board of directors have requested presentations from, from various uh, entities to try to figure out how we look at the, to educate ourselves on how we get the best, um, the highest return on investment as we think about uh, um, air pollution mitigation um, strategies. Um, so we also had a, an, a presentation from Alex Gordon from North Front Range MPO. Um, he presented on the regional transit corridors and how they incorporate transit into planning. Um, so really excited to learn more about BRTs and how those play a critical role in, um, in the whole plan. Um, Third, I just want to share real quick that I attended the Dr. Cog RTC meeting. Um, it was very informative. Um, they always are. But one of the areas, uh, the biggest highlight that I'll share is that um, they did a, the, they share the demographic analysis. And one of the areas that just struck my, uh, my attention was that they shared that the, the fastest growing population is older adults, older than 65 years old. And this is uh, growing seven times faster than the under 65 population, seven times faster. I knew our population was aging. I just didn't realize it was that fast. <laughs> <laughs> and so as we think about our strategies and how we create a, a, an equitable system, um, we just need to think about the unique needs of all, all of our populations. And so um, with that, there were many other highlights, but in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Commissioner Holgang. Uh, Vice Chair Beatty. Yeah, I want to echo the accolades for our maintenance teams as they're out there trying to keep our roads open and safe as best we can through all the, the snow we're having this year, which is good for our water and our, all the other industries that re require that natural uh, water we get. I um, want to mention that the Northeast region, we've actually had to have the snow blowers come out and, and help clear roads um, because of the heavy snows we've had out there. That's normally reserved for the mountain corridors, but we've actually had to bring them out east this year due to the extended snow cover we're having, which is has been unusual, but is not unheard of for east, eastern Colorado. Um, and want to thank all the, the maintenance crews out there trying to keep us safe. Um, want to mention that a lot of the safety that we're facing is is actually coming back to the, the general public and we have to have them their partnership in reducing their speeds for the un, unexpected ice as we're seeing in the Glenwood Canyon. We're also still seeing it in eastern Colorado because the winds can pick up when we have this continual snow cover and any little bit of snow will suddenly ice up our, our interstates and we need people to slow down. Um, we actually want to share an incident that ended up in our local paper, but we actually had a truck that motioned for a person to slow down that was fishtailing in front of them. Well, that person then got upset that the truck driver was saying slow down and started to, to brake check the truck on the interstate down to where they were. And they actually got a fellow driver to partner with them and, and slow the traffic down to 20 mile an hour um, on, in front of that truck with continually braking and stopping in front of that truck, which then backed up traffic behind um, they ended up, the truck driver ended up calling because of the harassment and uh, law enforcement got involved and state patrol got stuck trying to turn around in the median um, <laughs> and delayed things and uh, local law enforcement. Um, ended up the driver that was harassing the truck was drunk um, and they cited that person and got to, taken to jail once they got him stopped. But the truck driver was also harassed and things and uh, it's a situation where the public, we need to show respect to each other on the road. Um, and I request that we we do that throughout a lot of the issues we're seeing with safety and fatalities and accidents is a, a, a lack of respect between uh, the drivers and respecting uh, the conditions of the road at the time. So um, just a public request that we all respect each other better on the roads as we work through the weather conditions that we face in Colorado. Um, attended the Region 4, uh, 4 TPR meeting, um, had a lot of good information on the projects that we've completed and been designed and things. Wanted to just have a shout out to our uh, Region 4 engineers um, that have uh, internally designed some projects and the project savings 
on those that, that they've realized by not having to contract out. Um, they were able to do some of the engineering, I believe it was around 6% of the cost of the project rather than the standard of around 10% that usually happens when we contract those out. And uh, it's one of those areas where we can have savings by bringing that engineering back in house and region four has done a good job of doing that on projects that we can do in house. Um, would maybe like to have a presentation to the commission on kind of what's been going on with that at some point in the future. Um, also, I wanted to highlight we had a train actually get stuck out on along I-70 that took a while to get dug out with uh, backhoes and stuff to get a train unstuck. And I've seen it years ago, um, but uh, to have it happen again is is unusual to see those pictures of a train stuck out in the middle of a snowfield and because of the drifting that continually drifts back in when you plow it open, it just keeps getting deeper and it finally caught a train. So <laughs> um, it's impacting all of our, our travel modes and our freight movement within our state. So uh, just ask that everybody please uh, slow down in corridors that uh, has ice show up suddenly or like the Glenwood Canyon issues we're having and the efforts they're doing to try to reduce those accidents. Um, but it comes back to the public has to uh, uh, help us with that. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Beatty. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, that, as we know, CDOT is the state safety champion. And we just had a wonderful brief at breakfast by our chief engineer, Keith Stefanik, and head of safety, San Lee. And as you look at the figures, which they are working hard to turn the trend, which uh, we are, have record-breaking uh, fatalities, it's sad to note that a third of those fatalities happen to people who are not in motor vehicles, whether pedestrians, bikes, motorcycles, et cetera. A third of fatalities involve impaired driving. And I want to comment and agree with what uh, Commissioner Beatty said about uh, the road rage increase, especially since COVID. So there's a lot going on, and I'm thankful that uh, CDOT is taking the lead in trying to turn the trend. The other thing I really appreciate was the announcement that next uh, Wednesday, Thursday, February 22nd and 23rd, at KOA at the maintenance headquarters, there'll be a General Motors sponsored battery electric vehicle uh, first responder training. So if you haven't heard about that, pass that on to your first responders or interested parties. That's a really uh, excellent opportunity to be able to uh, get training. I think it's going to be the only event in the Rocky Mountain State area uh, this year. So thank you for putting that together. And let's turn it over to our director, Shoshana Lu for her report. Sure, uh, good morning, everybody. And um, I think a lot of what uh, I was gonna raise has already been said, but I will focus a bit on some of the personnel moves with some welcomes. I think we have all started talking about Chief Engineer, uh, Chief Stefanik, as if it's been uh, in place for a long time, but actually that's only been announced in the last month. Um, but, you know, having served a fantastic tenure as our deputy chief engineer and before that the project manager on Central 70, our biggest project, he has a depth of experience and wisdom in the department that makes it a very seamless transition. So I think uh, we are grateful that he took on the new challenge, but it's kind of nice that it feels like a non-announcement. Um, I also um, believe that we announced Shane at the last meeting, but uh, ju just, just, just in case uh, I didn't mentioned it last time, want to do a hat tip to the seamless transition in region two, which has been going phenomenally well as well. And, you know, again, a case where you sort of wouldn't notice that there's been change on the RTD team because folks have blended in um, really seamlessly. Lots of work to staff up on other teams, new and old. You know, one thing I just mentioned is that Marsha has been doing quite a bit of uh, exciting recruiting in the last few weeks and brought on a couple of new hires, which is the first, um, I believe set of onboarding we've had in the equity office since this establishment and is very exciting. The breadth of talented candidates that we got for a new office was really neat to see. And we're seeing some of those folks applying for other roles at CDOT too. Um, and it's nice to see that we can have a new line of business that gets really 
um, qualified and extensive um, candidates from across the state. So that's uh, lo lots of exciting news there. And then finally, I would just do a hat tip to Kay, who's been really um, branching out in terms of some of the work that the Innovative Mobility team has started to bring to fruition on a range of different kinds of projects. Um, I just got a briefing on some of the work that they're doing on workforce training, especially in the last week or two. And, you know, I think we, we know that they've been um, getting deeper on some of the systemic issues we're going to need to deal with to integrate electrification, but really cool to see our team um, jumping out ahead of those issues. And I thought the briefing yesterday gave you a taste of some of what's been going on in that division. And it's nice to sort of see that all going to the next level, along with just really cool dialogue around the grants where, again, uh, re really seeing strong demand for programs that we didn't have a few years ago, and that's uh, cool to see. Um, you've heard a lot about the maintenance team's incredible work this winter, but I would second that and, you know, third that and on and on again. And, you know, a big thank you to John and to Bob and to you know, all of the regional uh, leads, but with a special um, nod to Sage, who has had a particularly difficult winter, but is really handling it outstandingly. You know, we're seeing the vacancy numbers you know, go significantly down from the beginning of the season. You know, we've um, decreased the maintenance vacancies by about 100, which is pretty amazing. We're seeing um, people stay uh, in a more steady cadence. And we're also seeing the vast majority of folks who are going through our commercial driver's licensing program um, stick with the teams they started with, but more importantly, with CDOT as a whole. And I'm um, just really good to see the confluence of those efforts along with the uh, compensation measures we're putting in place to pay our maintainers what they're worth, um, you know, really make a difference in terms of having a full team and um, having morale be at a higher point than it was a few months ago. So great work there, notwithstanding the challenges. And, um, you know, our folks are up against a lot, but are really doing an incredible job, even in places that are getting uh, phenomenal snowpack that's hard for us. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I would end with just a word on the situation in the canyon, which, um, you know, as many of you know, is sort of the gift that keeps on giving for our team. You know, we have a lot of uh, empathy for the folks on the Western Slope who are dealing you know, with closures that just feel like insult to injury after all the challenges we've seen in that area over the last couple of years. And, you know, I think our team shares the sense that this is really a driver behavior problem, you know, with a real um, urgency that needs to be addressed and we're doing everything that we can, but it starts, you know, it starts and ends with the fact that it's a difficult area and in harsh conditions, we just need everybody, you know, whether they're driving a car or a commercial vehicle to be careful to obey the speed limit and to, you know, really be deferential to the conditions in, you know, what is one of the most complicated parts of the interstate in Colorado and probably anywhere. You know, a lot of the incidents that have been seen over the last you know, weeks and more, you know, do involve these jackknife incidents, a lot of speeding, among other issues. But, you know, really, um, th these are curves that are hard to go around too fast if it, conditions are good, let alone when it's snowing and, you know, it's a place that becomes very icy. You know, our, our crews, along with CSP, have been taking a host of you know, really creative but far-reaching measures to try and do what we can to slow down traffic. You know, yesterday we had... Um, plow operators driving side by side at 35 miles an hour to meter traffic at the safe speed. Um, there, there were several uh, CSP enforcement checkpoints that had been added given the challenges and, um, you know, really just a lot of work to get the speed limit down. And, you know, unfortunately, we're still seeing a lot of these incidents and, you know, that is hard for everyone. And, you know, the disruptions are very, very real and we're going to need to do more. But, you know, I think it's important to kind of remind everybody that the measures that are being put in place are not there to be punitive. They're there to keep people safe in a difficult area. So with that, I will uh, pass it off. Thank you, uh, Director Liu. Uh, Chief Engineer Keith Stefanik's report. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I think I'm just going to start with a, a thank you to uh, the prior Chief Harrelson. He was... Uh, tough act to follow. I have retired, or he has retired at the book book club with, with, with himself as well, so I will not be continuing that. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot from Steve uh, from, a, from just a personal perspective and a professional perspective, and I, and I hope to carry on a lot of the good traits that he had and that he brought to the, the position, so I'm, I'm very excited. It's a, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to be the chief engineer at the, at the state of or for CDOT. 
it, it starts with, you know, really working in collaboration with the executive management team. I've had such good conversations over the past week and a half as I've been in this new position, whether it's with Herman in the morning or it's passing by um, some individuals in the executive suite or just with the RTDs at breakfast this morning. Uh, we have a lot of great individuals here at CDOT and I'm very excited to continue working with them and moving uh, this department forward. So also excited to work with our stakeholders. We have numerous stakeholders, which, whether it's FHWA, the local agencies, uh, really to communicate, collaborate, partner with them to bring a lot of our initiatives forward. But also with industry, uh, we need, whether it's our consultants, whether it's our contractors, we need them to help us deliver our program. And it's really to understand their perspectives, understand our perspectives and figure out how we can meet in the middle and really move things forward. Um, one of the things I'm looking most forward to is working with the regions. I've, uh, over my past two and a half years as deputy chief engineer, I've got out and worked with region three, down with region five, region four, all of the regions. And it's just, it's a tremendous, um, it's just tremendous to see the amount of work that they accomplish, the amount of teamwork that they have, and really try to bring that back um, and feed that into our headquarters staff as well. So um, I'm really looking forward to, as Director Lou mentioned, uh, Shane Ferguson is the new RTD down at Region 2. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to learn, uh, learn more about him, see his ways, and really feed from all of the RTDs because it's a good group of individuals. It's uh, a lot of laughs at whether it was uh, Rebecca's going away party last night or breakfast this morning. It's just great to see a, a good a good team. So that moves me to you know what's what's my what's my priorities over my first thirty days here in this position. Uh, first off, it's it's to continue to focus on safety, just like the breakfast meeting this morning and, and taking a look at the data. We really need to focus on how we can advance transportation safety uh, here in this state. And so I'll be working directly, more directly with our safety team, whether it's traffic safety and engineering, our highway safety office, or our, our communications department to see how we can get out and touch more people and bring that safety culture to everyone. I also want to listen. I want to listen to all of the teams here at CDOT, whether it's the regions, whether it's uh, departments here within CDOT, and see what they have to say. Listen to them, see where I can help with efficiencies, uh, see what their goals, their priorities are, and really incorporate that all, all together and move that forward. I also want to sit down with our stakeholders. Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I want to work uh, closer with John uh, with FHWA. I want to work with some of our locals. I want to work with our, our industry partners and just understand uh, where they're headed because what we're going to get into is a larger capital construction program here in calendar year 23. And that's one of the things I wanted to mention was in the, uh, the monthly cash balance update that Jeff Sudemeyer had, there's a, our forecast for calendar year 23. It's right around 869 million. It's the largest uh, capital expenditure forecast that we have here at, at CDOT. And just to give you a little bit of background in, tw in calendar year 2022, we had 841 million. In 21, 615 million. In 20, 809 million. And in, in, in calendar year 19, 669 million. So it's definitely, it's about 28 million more than last year. Uh, we need to make sure that our industry can help us deliver that. We can't do it ourselves. We need to make sure uh, we have, whether it's through workforce development, all kind of initiatives, make sure that there is enough uh, individuals out there to help us deliver our program. So, um, in closing, I'm very excited. Uh, feel free to hit me up anytime you have questions. Um, I, I want to focus on communication. I think that's a key uh, to, to success. And I'm really looking forward to this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Director Liu, for um, appointing me to th this position. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a really a career goal, and, and I look forward to serving the best I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Engineer Stefanik. We really appreciate your overview and your dedication, and thank you for stepping up. Let's go to CTIO Director Nick Farber's report. Yeah, Steve was a tough act to follow, especially uh, at these meetings. Um, so I just want to announce that unfortunately the Central 70 February 28th uh, tolling go live has been delayed until spring of this year, which is 
which in turn has pushed back the I-25 South Gap tolling go live until summer. Our tolling equipment provider, Electronic Transaction Consultants, or ETC, set up their phase two environment, which allow, amongst other things, allow us to will allow us to price tolling dynamically, was not finished on time. And the testing of the equipment with the E470s back office did not go well. Um, for instance, I, I told the board yesterday that um, with the Westbound Mountain Express Lane, we obviously don't run it 24-7. When we shut it down to zero dollars, it would actually shut off the Central 70 express lanes as well. Um, I've, yeah, so that was part of the equipment. So um, ETC is, we asked ETC a couple of weeks ago for a reme remediation plan under the contract we have with them. They submitted a remediation plan to us last Friday. Um, in that they give a date on when they think testing will, their testing will be done and the phase two environment will be up and running. Um, we don't yet have enough confidence to announce that publicly, but hope to Monday or Tuesday. Um, once they're done with testing E470, our tolling back office provider will then have to do about six weeks of testing. Um, so we're hoping mid spring uh, for that and summer for, for the gap. Um, I'll have more information to you next month on hopefully on a, on a go live date. I had hoped to announce it yesterday at the board meeting and tell you today. But unfortunately, I'm not in that. We're not in that position. Um, also, just want to thank again. I thanked uh, the E470 the executive director, Bill Memory, and his staff yesterday for helping us out and getting to uh, at least get this done as, as fast as possible and accommodating us. Um, um, also, uh, in terms of the TIFI alone, we've been uh, Piper Darlington on uh, the CTI staff has been working very hard uh, with the Build America Bureau. Uh, to uh, finalize the TIFI loan, uh, we're getting close in all the related documents, getting close on the TIFI loan and all the related documents. Um, we've been updating the financial model to include additional funding for segment five, responding to additional due diligence questions from the Build America Bureau, uh, getting a new indicative rating on the updated loan size and finalizing updates to all loan documents. Um, we're targeting a spring 2023 close in the TIFI loan so anticipation of that, we're meeting with the uh, executive management team next week to walk through what is exactly in the TIFI loan and the related documents like the direct agreement and the master trust indenture and requirements that not only CTIO will have to live up to, but CDOT will have to abide by as well. So we'll be getting feedback from EMT on that next Tuesday. Uh, and we hope to have a workshop, a joint workshop between the board and the TC in March. Uh, with approval on all documents in April from both the board and the commission. Um, and that, the thing is that timing on that is all kind of predicated on making sure, so we might just have to go March, April, but the, the approval could be pushed out to May because of there are some congressional notification timelines in there that we might hit, might not, might not hit. And we also have internal USDOT approvals that has to go through as well. So. Um, we're getting close. It's just that we hit all those, you know, we're just hoping to hit all those timelines. And that's all I have in terms of the director's report. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Seeing no questions. Thank you very much. And thank you for the heads up on the TIFIA loan workshop that we'll participate in. Appreciate it. Next, let's go to John Cater, FHWA Division Administrator's Report. I can't hear Cater at all. Is the microphone turned off? We're checking that right now, Commissioner okay. Hall. Uh, Thank you. There. That work? Yeah, it was it flipped somehow. So anyway, uh, Everyday Counts National Summit's going on right now. And that's um, almost 3,000 people nationally looking at, at innovative technologies that are ready to implement, but for whatever reason, haven't been implemented yet. So uh, we're focusing on seven particular ones, but it's going on right now. And I said, see, that's... Uh, Got several people involved with it presenting as well as, uh, as attending. So great to see looking for looking for technologies to help us advance uh, advance various things nationally. Um, Colorado, there's a lot going on with grants here, both nationally and here. Uh, we received 20 uh, Safe Streets for All grants here a few weeks ago. Uh, most of those are planning grants, a couple for capital. But again, good things going on there that we can take some of these ideas, get a plan to implement them, and then 
hopefully rolling forward with, with uh, projects in the future. Um, I do want to talk about safety, though. Um, you guys apparently had a, had a breakfast meeting this morning, and I think it's, it's great to hear the, the, the focus on safety. We've, um, we had a good uh, executive over, oversight group uh, presentation, uh, I believe it was last week, from, from CDOT, and talked about the, what's going on now, where we're headed with implementing the Strategic Highway Safety Plan or Strategic Transportation Safety Plan. And there's, we've done a lot of good things, but the numbers are still moving in the wrong direction. We, we heard earlier this morning about a lot of the issues we're having. And so just wanted to highlight, we had a, a NHTSA sponsored a, a presentation for us earlier this week, talking about some of the things we can do with technology, things we can do in, in that realm to, to augment what we're doing in safety. And they've got technology now that can, can take any vehicle and look at seatbelt use, cell phone use, speeding, and then some other distractions as well. So it's again, it's a way of giving us more, um, more data. And what do we do with that data? Well, it could be any number of things. We could, we could do, so you could do photo enforcement. You could do manual enforcement. You could send information out. You could use it simply as data to say, these vehicles were, had these sorts of um, high risk activities. Are they overrepresented in, in, act, in accidents or incidents in the next three months, six months, year? Um, a lot of things you can do with that. Or do you focus on uh, maybe critical corridors, work zones? Um, there's a lot of things you can do with that. But I think the bigger point and the, and the real point is that there's some technologies out there that we need to continue to investigate. And there's things that are out there that may be able to help us address some of these issues because it's, I think we're at the point where what we've been doing has is, is been fine, but we have to keep, keep finding new ways and more innovative ways. So again, I really appreciate NHTSA for, for sponsoring that. And uh, I think we need to continue to be looking for for more ways we can address our challenges in safety. So uh, with that, I'll close. I have a question. I have a Go question. Ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner Hall. I'm confused. How do you determine from each car those kinds of issues? They have, they have, uh, you go on, it's kind of like with, with, uh, with tolling, you have a, they have a series of cameras at various angles and they have one that's, that's almost directly down. So you can see inside through the windshield into the, uh, into the cab or into the, the passenger compartment. So you see, you get a, a view of both the driver and the passenger and do they have a belt across or not? Yeah. Uh, do they have a cell phone in their hand or not? Um, and you've got multiple stations so you can, you can get a, a point to point speed check. They can also see if they've got a dog in their lap, a baby in their lap, uh, eating, um, doing all sorts of things. It's, um, it's it, you know it, it's using it, it's, it's nothing it's not it's not like infrared or something like that it's, it's just photo. Can you tell if they're playing games on their fancy computer on the screen? Probably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, interesting. I just kind of was a shock to me. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's amazing, and they they showed they showed you know examples, and uh, they they've implemented this in North Carolina and in Australia. And there, you know, the couple, they, some of the, the more serious or egregious ones, there's one with a woman, she had a baby in her lap, she had her cell phone on, she was eating, and she was kind of driving with her knee and the baby. I mean, I don't know how she pulled all that off, but it's amazing. No belt, you know, no seat belt. So, um, yeah. So that then can give the law enforcement an opportunity to stop them, say, if they're eating. I mean, how does that, how does that work? If they're eating? Um, like if they're yeah. eating or if they're, they're in the cell phone, they can, they can, if the laws require in the state that they, that they can't use your cell phone, like gives them reason to pick them up. Is that how that works? It could be in, in the, yeah, it has to be by that jurisdiction. So I don't, I don't know uh, the particulars um, in North Carolina. Anyway, the example they gave, you can't be using your, your uh, cell phone while you're, you're driving. So in that case, they, they could not North Carolina hasn't implemented the, the, uh, they haven't done it on photo enforcement. They, they simply say, we've got a picture of this person and they're, they're in this, they get a license plate number as well. And they'll, they're, you know, a half mile away, they're headed your way, you know, and they can choose to pull them over or, or not if they're available. Oh. Um, but, you know, you can take it any, you can, you can take that any, in Australia, they, they do do photo enforcement. Um, I don't know that there's an appetite for that here today, but, uh, you know, it, it, but again, there's, you've got options. You know, maybe you send them a card in the mail and say, hey, you know, please, please uh, be more attentive, you know, or, or something. That's interesting. Thank you. So, all right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, Commissioner Vasquez. 
Just a quick question. Can you enumerate some of the new technologies that you mentioned at the beginning of your brief? Pardon me? The new technologies. Oh, yeah, I should have, I should have, uh, <laughs> I don't have those off the top of my head. I know uh, one of them that CDOT's involved with is um, uh, DBEs on design build projects, how to, how to uh, adequately uh, track and incorporate DBEs on, on design build projects. There's another one on, on um, greenhouse gas, um, not greenhouse gas, uh, the- uh, oh, Perhaps you could follow up with me after. Yeah, <laughs> I, will, I will get those to you. Because there's one on the, the, the uh, product, uh, what's called the environmental product declarations for like um, pavements and stuff. Uh, there's a term for it and I'm, I'm escaping me, but yeah, I'll get those to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the comments and questions. Uh, let's go to uh, Stack Report, Vince Rogalski. Morning, commissioners. Bring this down just a little. That might be a little better. Um, Stack met at the beginning of the month, and Herman gave us a really great report introducing some of the new people. Um, and he also began talking about um, what was coming up at the commission meeting here. And one of the things that the Stack is working on is an annual work plan. And so um, the intent of this plan is to identify areas of CDOT's work where stack can be of value, fulfill their statutory uh, advisory role for CDOT and commission and serve as a productive forum for exchanging viewpoints from around the state and achieve consensus. And so I think this is gonna work really you know, well because we'll be able to see what's coming up what we really have to pay attention to and what decisions we have to make to recommend certain um, pathways. And so Herman gave us a really good um, update there. Um, we introduced the fact that the, uh, the TAP program was approved and the applications are sending out, but there's a couple of people in Stack who were disappointed with the decision that you guys made. And um, at some point, and Herman knows, um, they might like to talk to you about their point of view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we haven't had a legislative report. We're still lo looking for a representative, right? Still now. Okay. Good. We had an update on winter maintenance, and it's really important that we really focus on all the work they do and the wonderful work they do in cleaning the roads. And we just had a couple of days of experience in terms of how uh, everybody wants to get around and they want the roads clean. And CDOT has been doing very well in getting this done. Um, you know, I could say that over the years of experience I had, I have not missed a meeting since that because of snow on the road, because they've kept it clear and I've been able to make the meetings and it's really good. Um, as uh, Shoshana mentioned, uh, the job vacancies are down. One of the interesting things, and this is at the beginning of the month, is there are 282 avalanches uh, that the uh, CDOT had declared the roads for. And that was amazing. That was at the beginning of the month. So I don't know what the number is now, but avalanches are persistent, especially when you get this kind of a snow coming in and uh, you know, coming down the mountain at the uh, roadside. Um, annual accomplishment. You know, we do a lot of planning. We put a lot of plans together, but sometimes we don't realize what we've already accomplished in terms of, of uh, repairs, new roads, uh, safety features and things like that. So we had a little report on that. And um, with the 10 year plan and we've got uh, fifth, let's see, 538 miles of rural road that have been improved because of the special program that we started a couple of years ago. And so um, one of the things that's really been interesting is Co-Trip. I don't know how many people use Co-Trip, but Co-Trip really is providing more and more information as they upgrade, upgrade the um, software. And I, I was on it myself trying to figure out 
what the roads were going to be like and this type of thing. And they could tell you where all the plows are. You can get a map anywhere in the state. And so it's just really interesting, provide a lot of information to help safely drive around the area. Um, the next uh, statewide plan is going to be started here this summer, I think in June or July. And, you know, we do this every four or five years uh, and put together a long range plan. And this plan, I think, is going to be a 2050 plan. You know, and the 10 year plan process really helped us to get a really good start on all of this and how we're going to work on it. Now, Stack was presented with various options and how we begin to talk about um, resource allocation is one of the first things we have to do. And so we talked about subcommittees, special committees, or all of Stack being part of the beginning of this process. And I think they voted to go with all of Stack at the beginning to try and figure out what we want to do and how we share resources as we go around the state. Um, TAP program I mentioned is um, out and applications are coming in. Now, remember applications that are gonna be coming in have to be reviewed first by an engineer in your region. And uh, then you can put together a full uh, application. And that process is trying to help the people who are applying to make sure they haven't missed something or they, they um, miscalculated some things so that the application that they do present is a lot better presented and gives a, a better idea of what they want in terms of applying for the TAP money. So um, uh, let's see. There was something else I wanted to mention. Oh, one of the things that Herman mentioned was the proposed House Bill 1101, which would add to the stack, or excuse me, to the TPRs and the MPOs, uh, a voting member from the transit community to each one of those things. And so we would get additional, um, well, we got uh, 15 members all together, plus a couple of Indian tribes. So we'd add some more people to each of those TPRs, not to the meetings, but to the TPRs so that we can help coordinate an overall plan that includes transit, which is really, uh, becoming a really big issue now and moving forward and helping to move people. So um, we're going to see how that is. It's all going to be in the details on how that happens because each of the communities and TPRs have a lot of people who are in the transit business. And how do you select one for that particular T TPR? And so it's going to be in the details. Now, that doesn't say that uh, TPR members are not transit people. It just says that this person that will be selected will be specifically transit. Now, there are transit people who are um, councilmen, commissioners, this type of thing, but they, they come to the TPR as somebody looking at um, highways other transportation other than transit at the moment, even though they're involved with transit. So, but this person will be a specific transit person. And so I think we might get mo a lot more input knowing that that's going to happen. Questions? Uh, we don't have any questions. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Let's act on the consent agenda. There are five resolutions. Do we have a motion to approve? I move to approve the consent agenda. Thanks, Commissioner Garcia. Second. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hogan has seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 O opposed? And any abstentions? None, uh, the consent agenda passes. Next, 
We'll discuss and act on proposed resolution number six, which is the budget supplement of fiscal year 2023, which we were briefed on yesterday. Jeff Sudmeyer. Good morning. I'm requesting your approval of the eighth supplement to the fiscal year 23 CDOT budget. Uh, the supplement includes two items requiring your approval, which, as the chair indicated, we uh, covered in workshops yesterday. Uh, the first is a request from Region 4 for $1.2 in TC contingency funding for the US-34 Brush Canal Emergency Repair Project. Um, these funds would supplement $4 million in contingency funding that was approved for this project in September to address a failing irrigation canal that abuts the highway. Uh, the funds will allow the region to complete three priority locations which have been designed uh, after funding proved adequate um, only to address the first two locations. So. Um, the 1.2 million will allow uh, the region to add back that uh, that third location. Um, the second request is a request from Region 5 for 2.25 million in TC contingency funding for the US 550 160 connection project. This also involves an irrigation canal. Um, in this case, the 2.25 million in funds will supplement 1.5 million in project contingency to cover a settlement. Uh, agreement with the contractor. Uh, the settlement agreement relates to a change order uh, and schedule delay that resulted from the ditch company uh, requiring uh, design changes from what was approved, originally approved as, uh, as um, the design for the modified canal. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I request that you consider a motion to approve. Seeing no questions, do we have a motion to approve? This is Commissioner Brackey. I move to approve resolution six, the budget supplement for FY23. Thank you, this Commissioner. Is Kathy and I second that. Kathy Hall seconds it. Any discussion? All those in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Proposed budget resolution number six passes. Next, discuss and act on proposed resolution number seven, which is policy directive 703. Jeff Sudmeyer. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting your approval of a resolution adopting uh, updates to the Transportation Commission policy directive 703. Um, this update was the subject of workshops yesterday and uh, in, uh, in January as well. Um, the majority of the updates included uh, our, our technical or clerical in nature, uh, including adding new programs, removing old programs, simplifying or clarifying language, um, and make, also making updates to align with a new federal and state legislation. Uh, the most substantive change, which was discussed at length in workshops, uh, was the proposal to modify the commission approval requirements for annual project and program level approvals within the innovative mobility budget. Um, in this update, we are proposing that those now be subject to executive management team approval, provided they follow OIM's documented budget process. I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'd request you consider a motion to approve. I move that we approve proposed resolution number seven on policy directive 703. Thank you, Commissioner Vasquez moves to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Beatty. Any discussion on proposed resolution number seven? Chair, it's Commissioner Stewart. I'd like to thank Jeff and the staff for clarifying all my questions and concerns that I had uh, earlier about uh, making changes to the approval process for the Transportation Commission. My concern, of course, was that um, the Transportation Commission's responsibility and authority is to approve budgets. And with the understanding that um, this change is um, still allowing the Transportation Commission at any time to um, question anything in the budget and get clarification. Um, and so I really appreciate the time and effort you took from last month to this month to make those changes. And I appreciate Kay Kelly and her office for um, giving us very thorough explanations of how this change um, affects their department and makes it more efficient and uh, helpful to move forward. So thanks very much. I appreciate that. Just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that um, that there had been some concerns a, year, a month ago and those concerns have been allayed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Stewart. We appreciate all the effort that went in by uh, 
Kay Kelly and Jeff to thoroughly discuss this. Any other discussion? All those in favor of proposed resolution number seven, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstentions? Resolution number seven passes. Next, discuss and act on proposed resolution number eight. This is the State Infrastructure Bank new loan, Jeff Sudmeyer. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting your approval of a loan from the aeronautics account of the State Infrastructure Bank. Uh, the loan is for $3,737,580 uh, uh, to the Grand Junction Regional Airport Authority for the expansion of their commercial terminal vehicle parking uh, and the rehabilitation of the primary general aviation uh, and airfield access taxiway. Uh, the Colorado Aeronautics Board uh, validated the aviation purpose and approved the request of the loan in December. Uh, the CDOT Office of Financial Management and Budget reviewed the application and supporting materials and has found the application complete, meeting the requirements of uh, the SIB Policy Directive 720.1. Um, it also found that the airport has the means to repay the lo net loan, namely um, net operating revenues are forecast to be uh, at least five times the coverage required uh, to make payments. Um, per SIB uh, Policy Directive 720.1, the Loan Review Committee of the TC, which is composed of Commissioner Stanton, Aeronautics Director Dave Ulane, and myself met to review the loan and recommended advancing it to the full commission for approval. Uh, the loan has a 10 year repayment period with a fixed rate of 3% based on the SIB interest rate in place at the time of the application, resulting annual debt service totals 438,158. Um, we have not incurred significant time or cost in processing this application. Uh, and as such, we are recommending that uh, the commission not impose origination fees. I'm happy to answer any questions. Otherwise I'd request you consider a motion to approve. I move for approval of the pro Proposed resolution number eight. Commissioner Hall moves to approve second. I second it, Commissioner Hickey. Thank you, Commissioner Hickey. Is there any discussion? May I ch chair just briefly? Sure, go ahead, we, Commissioner Hickey. We uh, approved a similar loan to the Colorado Springs Airport. When I first got on the commission, it was two months in or something a couple of years ago now. And um, that's just really been a fantastic impact. Those small airports are so important for our economic development. And I think that this can really support the, uh, the local re whole region really supported by these airports. So I just wanted to pass on that note. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hickey. And um, Director Dave Ulane is here. And I know he appreciates hearing that. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, none. And any abstentions? Resolution number eight passes, thank you. Next, discuss and act on proposed resolution number nine, the request open permanent rulemaking on Colorado State Infrastructure Bank rules, Herman. Yes, uh, for this item and the next item, which is also a rule, we're going to defer to Sari Whitebrook, who's our uh, rules person, but we do have uh, Dave Ulane and Dan Rusin for the, the two items if there's any subject matter expert questions that might come up. Good morning, okay. Commission. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Sari. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so it's been a while since we've done some rulemaking, so we have two for you today as Herman mentioned the first follows on from your last action item. We're requesting um, authorization to open two CCR 605-1, which is the Colorado State Infrastructure Bank rule. Uh, this rule is on our docket for a mandatory rule review. It was last updated in 2009. Uh, most of the red line changes you see, there, there is a lot of red, but most of it is really updating format and um, improving accessibility to meet our state accessibility targets. So you'll see that in all of our rulemaking that we'll be doing that. Um, key change is adding a definition for the Colorado Aeronautical Board or CAB, and then adding the ability for the CAB to approve the SIB loans for aviation projects directly. Um, so as Jeff just came to you for that, um, the board would then be able to do that themselves, sort of expedites the process a little bit, reduces a little bureaucracy, 
um, but still provides all the same um, process that we've been using up until that to this point. Um, the other change that we have, you've noticed in our past rulemaking that we've been adding declar declaratory order language, which is kind of standard boilerplate. That's included in this updated rule since it's been so long since we've opened it. We did hold a stakeholder meeting on Friday um, with our airport stakeholders and other, um, other people who have received SIB loans um, in the recent past or people who have expressed interest. We had one attendee from Colorado Springs Airport. They were very supportive of this proposed change. We did not receive any written comments to our emailed notice. Should you approve this action, we are asking that you also delegate a hearing officer to hold a rulemaking hearing, which we anticipate would be held on April 7th at 10 a.m. We'll send out notice um, to all stakeholders and interested parties as we usually do. Um, and if you do not have any questions about the process, I would ask that you consider a motion to approve the resolution. Thank you very much, Sari, for explaining the process. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? I'll move to approve proposed resolution number nine, request open permanent rulemaking for 2CCR 605-1. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Vasquez, second. I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Beatty, seconds. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? None. Any abstentions? Resolution number nine passes. Thank you. Next, discuss and act on proposed resolution number 10, the State Highway Access Category Assignment Schedule Rulemaking Update with Dan Rusin. So that will be me again. Um, okay, although, Sarah, although, go ahead. <laughs> Dan is in the room if you have any technical questions um, about the rule that I cannot answer. He is definitely the expert on that. Um, so again, this is the mandatory rule review item. Um, we thought we were going to tackle this in the fall, but Dan has done a lot of stakeholder engagement, uh, talking with local governments. Um, so that took a little longer than we expected. So we are here now uh, moving these two rules forward together on the same schedule, which maybe will make things easier. This rule was last updated in 2013. And essentially, it's a list or a chart of state highway segments and their categories. Uh, so there have been approximately 40 changes since this last update in 2013. And we're proposing to basically do housekeeping and make it accurate for um, how, how state highway segments are owned today and categorized today. Um, Dan does have letters of support from local governments who have requested category changes and has, has talked to everyone and, and they are all on board with the proposed changes. Again, a lot of the red that you see is some of the updating format um, and adding that declaratory order language, which we did not have in the last update. And for this rulemaking, we would anticipate a hearing on April 7th, same day as the other rule. And we would start at either 1030, so immediately we think following the prior rulemaking, um, or immediately upon its conclusion, no earlier than 1030. And I'll make that really clear in my stakeholder and interested party notification so everyone knows how we intend to do it, but it respects the time of our hearing officer. So if you do not have any questions, I would ask that you consider a motion to approve this resolution. Thank you, sorry. Do we have a motion? This is Commissioner Hart, I'll move to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Hart moves to approve. Second? I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Is there any discussion? A question, if I may. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner can, Garcia. Can you expand on the outreach that you did with the communities on updating this list, please? So I'll defer to Dan, who is in the room, because he's the one who did that outreach. Go ahead, Dan. Turn on a microphone. Can't hear uh, you. Just push that button if you would. Thank you. My apologies. Um, all all state highways are classified, um, and basically that's how we make determination on access. 
And what we do is our access managers meet with local governments and take a look at what needs to happen. So when we get a request, we, uh, we work with the region and, and the local government make a determination. So we have four changes in this, uh, this update with communities and all four of them have either requested it from to the region and we've accepted it or the other way where the region went to the local government. So that's normally how we, we go through it. So do we go to every community and ask them to look at it? No, um, only when, there's, when there are updates that need to happen. Are there any CDOT initiated changes or is it all community driven changes? It, at this point, it was only community changes that came to CDOT. And the updates, we also updated it because we devolved several highways and those are updates that we put in this. So most of them are housekeeping changes. So the ones that have come off the list were that housekeeping just- Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for clarifying that. Any other discussion? Hearing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve? It was a first and second. Yeah, we have. Okay, and uh, sorry. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstentions? Proposed resolution number 10 carries. Next, we will discuss and act on proposed resolution number 11. Proposed CTIO staffing and new tolling operations branch and divisions with Nick Farber and Kelly Brown. Who's got me this morning? Kelly's uh, on training. If the button, yeah, it's on. It's got that screen. Um, so last month we held a joint workshop between the board and the commission to discuss our new tolling operations branch as well as staffing support uh, for CTIO's growth over the next four fiscal years. Uh, four factors were identified as driving our need to uh, increase staffing. That's network growth, a new system functionality, legislative mandates, and, in, and an implementation of a new commercial tolling back office. Uh, to support the workloads, CTIO is requesting TC approve seven FTEs uh, this fiscal year, so we can fill the following seven positions. Two senior tolling traffic operations lead, four tolling traffic operators, and actually those are not, those will be just switching uh, contractors over to full-time employees, so we actually have contractors in those positions right now, and we'll just be changing those over to uh, state FTEs. And then one new toll system project manager to assist with the commercial back office implementation. Um, in the next, uh, Two fiscal years, next year and the year after that, we'll be requesting an additional 12 FTEs, so 19 in total, um, but that's still in flux. Uh, we plan to work very closely with CDOT um, to determine if those uh, additional 12 are actually needed in the coming years, just depending on workload. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have about the staffing increase. Otherwise, ask for uh, your approval. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Chair. Nick, uh, what with the labor market as it is, what do you think uh, the prospects are for filling these positions? Um, pretty good in terms of uh, like switching over the the, um, the six to uh, the six contractors to uh, state FTEs. We have people in those positions right now, and they're very interested in becoming state employees. Um, so I don't think any issues there. One, I think we need to find the expertise on how to implement the, help us implement the tolling back office. That could be a challenging position to hire. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Stewart moved to approve resolution uh, number 11 when appropriate. Thank you. And this is Adams and I would second that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Adams is seconding. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 11 passes. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Next, 
uh, will discuss and act on proposed resolution number 12, which is Colorado 119 Safety and Mobility Improvements Project with Heather Paddock, Keith Schaefer. And I will note that Commissioner Brackey has asked to abstain from this and over to Heather Paddock. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, yes, you have a resolution in front of you um, to pass a resolution to use the alternative delivery method of CMGC for State Highway 119 Mobility and Safety Improvement Project. Thank you. Any questions for RTD Paddock? Commissioner right. Stewart, when appropriate, I move to um, I move to support proposed resolution number 12. I move to approve. Commissioner okay. Stewart moves to approve. Who's second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Vasquez. Seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. And we note the abstention of Commissioner Brackey from this. Resolution number 12 passes. Thank you. We've completed the resolutions. Are there any recognitions, Herman? And other matters, um, first, I would like to uh, remind commissioners that Gary Vanish at the end of the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise meeting will be having interim reports, which will be a very exciting time. So please stay on for that. And second, uh, personal, I'm saddened to announce that I will be stepping down after the March meeting uh, Gary Beatty will take over. My wife Ellen and I have uh, made a decision. We're basically on our last trail ride and we'll be moving. I greatly have appreciated working with staff and uh, being in the commission. It's been a wonderful experience. As a result, um, I'm now appointing uh, Commissioner Stewart, Commissioner Hall and Commissioner Holgin to have a temporary committee to nominate the next vice chair, and they will report out at our March meeting. Uh, any other matters to come before the commission? If not, uh, the TC Transportation Commission is adjourned. We'll immediately convene the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise Board of Directors meeting. Uh, first, it's call to order and a roll call, please. Director Olkeen. Here. Director Adams. Here. Director Stewart? Here. Director Brackey? Here. Director Vasquez? Here. Director Hall? Here. Director Garcia? Here. Director Hickey? Here. Director Hart? Here. Vice Chair Beatty? Here. Chair Stanton? Here. Any public comments for the BTE? Thank you. None. So we'll act on the consent agenda, which includes BTE 1 to approve the regular meeting minutes of December 14th. And do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Hogan. Second? Second. Second, Commissioner Garcia. Any discussion? None. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda passes. Next, we'll discuss and act on proposed resolution number BTE 2. Six budget supplement for fiscal year 23, Jeff Sudmeyer. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting you. Your approval of the sixth supplement to the fiscal year 20 to increase the design phase budget of the I-270 critical bridges project in region one with 2,981,750 in faster bridge funds. These funds will be used to advance the six bridge and tunnel enterprise eligible bridges uh, in the project to the 40% design stage. Uh, all of these bridges are top tier bridges in the January 2023 BTE prioritization plan. Um, and then we will come back at a later date with an additional request to take the, these projects further along to final design. For right now, we're just asking for the funding to get to 40% design. Happy to answer any questions, otherwise I'd request a motion to approve. Commissioner Stewart, question. Go ahead, Commissioner Stewart. 
Thank you. So, Jeff, I appreciate this in front of us. This is maybe a question I've, we've got to ask somebody else, or maybe you know the answer, but uh, I know that there's been some uh, discussion about what the design for these bridges is going to be, whether it's a replacement of what's existing now or whether the bridges will be replaced to accommodate the um, 270 project uh, that will be um, using these adjacent bridges. The 270 anticipates the possibility of um, managed lanes on there and transit, maybe BRT, something like that of a transit component and whether we're able to build the bridges without predetermining uh, the EIS that's going to be done for those bridges. Hope I'm clear in what I'm asking. It's, uh, yeah, I don't think I, I asked that as well as I should have. No, I think, I think the question is clear and I'm, I am gonna phone a friend here. I'm gonna let the, uh, our, our esteemed chief engineer handle that one. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, Commissioner Stewart, uh, thank you for your question. So. We're going to figure all that out. That's uh, that. That's the best I can say right now. We're we are not going to build anything that we throw away. Uh, we will be as efficient as possible, but we can't make that. We we can't. I can't answer your questions until uh, we get our our project team together. Uh, we just signed the contract with our designer for the I two seventy critical bridge project. Uh, we're in the selection process for the construction manager, uh, which is the the contractor portion of the CMGC. So that, that will be, I think we're uh, soon shortlisting and then moving to some interviews there. Uh, we also have just kicked off uh, some internal processes for the EIS on the 270 corridor. So uh, we will be working in collaboration with all of our teams to make those decisions um, as efficiently and as quickly as possible. But uh, we, we wanna make sure we do the right thing. So we'll be working directly with FHWA and making sure that we do not predetermine anything um, but that we um, are once again doing the right thing on that corridor and getting those bridges um, off the poor bridges off our system and repaired as, as quickly as possible. Thank you. I know it's a dilemma. The bridges need to be repaired. They're at a point where they need to be repaired and we certainly wouldn't want to repair them and then um, have to go back in and change those bridges if the EIS determines that we're going to do a managed lane on there. So I appreciate your um, comments that you can't tell me now. I'll I'll, I'll keep waiting um, when you have a when you have an answer. I'm happy to hear it. So thanks. I appreciate that. Any other questions? I would then ask for a motion to approve BTE proposed resolution two. Commissioner Stewart, so so moved. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart moves second. Commissioner Hall second. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? None. And no any abstentions? None. So BTE2 resolution passes. Next, discuss and act on proposed resolution BTE3, the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise funding match for fiscal year 23 raise grant opportunity. Jeff Sudmeyer. Thank you. Um, I'm requesting your approval of a resolution establishing a commitment in principle to provide matching Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise funds to three projects we intend to submit under the RAISE competitive grant program. Uh, each of these structures are part of a larger 10 year plan project. Um, the requested amounts represent the full planned amount of the bridge and tunnel enterprise contribution uh, on these projects and uh, and ultimately the funds will help achieve an overall competitive level of non-federal match in the grant applications. Uh, the first of these requests is a request to commit up to 20 million in bridge and tunnel enterprise funding to the US 6th and Wadsworth interchange improvement project in region one. The second is a request to commit up to 18 million in bridge and tunnel enterprise funding to the I-76 phase four safety and mobility reconstruction project in region four. The third is a request to commit up to 14 million in BTE funding to the US-160 safety and mobility project, better known as Elmore's Corner in region five. Um, I'll note again that this is a commitment in principle only. Uh, we will submit applications by the deadline of February 28th. 
If we are successful in receiving grant funds for any of these three projects, we will then return to the, to the uh, enterprise board at a later date and at that point formally request that you commit those matching funds. Uh, but but your, your approval of the resolution today essentially allows us to move forward in identifying those amounts as match in the grant application. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'd request a motion to approve. Thank you. Do we have a motion? I move to approve. I have a question also. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Garcia moves to approve and go ahead with your question. I'll second uh, that. I'll second and that. And seconded by Commissioner Hall. Go ahead, Commissioner Garcia. What is the percentage match on these? Um, is it fixed for all three re requests or? Sure. So um, I think the, the you know, the discretionary grant applications in general, I think have, have to meet minimum required federal match, which is generally is 20%. That being said, that's usually not a very competitive percentage. So we try to get uh, a higher level of match just to be more competitive. Um, and I am looking at, um, to give you some examples, it's different for each of these, but um, US 6 and WADS is $127 million total. We are putting up 82 million of the match on that project. Um, I-76 phase four would be about a $65 million total project with about 40 million in match. Uh, US 160 safety and mobility, uh, about a $97 million project, we're putting up 52 million in match. So in each of those, uh, you know, that's over, over 50%. 50%. Yeah, great. Thank you for that information. Sure. Thank you. Any other discussion? Let's go ahead and vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstentions? Resolution BTE3 passes. Thank you, Jeff. Next, we'll do the uh, Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise second quarter of 23 quarterly report, Patrick Holinda. Good morning, directors. I'm here today to provide the briefing for the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise quarterly report for the second quarter of fiscal year 23. As of this quarter, all fiscal year 23 and 24 SB 260 bridge and tunnel fee budget resources were fully programmed with the board approval of a resolution to initiate the construction phase for the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel Consolidation Grouting Project. This critical project to mitigate water intrusion into the tunnel liner is the first tunnel project to be delivered through the bridge and tunnel enterprise. And the most recent example of how the bridge and tunnel fees authorized by SB 260 are being leveraged efficiently and effectively to support the delivery of CDOT's 10-year plan. Central 70 ribbon cutting also occurred in this quarter. I wanted to note this because this marks the completion of one of the bridge and tunnel enterprise's earliest programmatic goals, which was to remove and replace the uh, I-70 viaduct. This project removed over 600,000 square feet of poor deck, or poor deck area from the statewide bridge inventory. And at the time that this was removed, this accounted for one third of the total statewide poor deck area. Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise and CDOT are now in a good position to meet both federal and state PD-14 bridge performance targets for poor rated bridges because of the successful completion of this project. We also had four bridges that completed construction during this quarter, two of which were in Region 2 and two of which were in Region 3. Starting in Region 2, we completed US-285 over the South Fork of the South Platte River. So this is in Park County, just to the south of Fair Play. This was a scour critical timber bridge with a deteriorated substructure. So due to the scour critical classification of the bridge, the condition of the substructure and the potential for overtopping at this location. So this would be where the river actually runs over the top of the bridge deck. Uh, this was identified as a high risk structure and a program priority. Uh, we also replaced County Line Road over I-25 in El Paso County. This is just to the north of Monument. Uh, this was an existing structure with a porated deck and a porated substructure. It also had substandard roadway geometry and substandard clearances. Moving to Region 3, we replaced State Highway 92 over the Gunnison River in Delta County. Uh, this was a load posted, scour critical, fracture critical, and it also had substandard geometry. Um, so this really amounts to a myriad of safety concerns and risks associated with the structure. Um, in regards to the structure, there are also reported incidents of overweight vehicles utilizing the bridge, despite the posting. 
and reports of uh, truck traffic using local roads for a detour, um, certainly causing some damage to the roads and some concerns from the county and local residents um, due to the site distance at the intersection of the local roads and State Highway 92. And finally, we completed Box 211 on I-70 over Straight Creek in Summit County. This is between the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel and Silverthorne on I-70. So not only was the structure poor rated, but it also serves a key operational function for CDOT maintenance crews and first responders on this segment of I-70. Um, we had a situation where we had substandard vertical and horizontal clearance of the structure, so it could barely fit a CDOT plow. And on top of that, we had runoff from I-70 where water would come over the top of the box, freeze on top of the box and in the box, creating a safety hazard for maintenance crews and first responders. So we're happy to have that structure removed from the inventory as well. So overall, the enterprise's portfolio includes 30 projects that will address 76 bridges and approximately 500,000 square feet of four deck area. So while our continued progress is encouraging, I do wanna take this opportunity to um, let this group know or remind this group that we're still faced with the challenge of managing an aging bridge inventory. Um, so now we have structures. Uh, if you look at the average structure on an inventory, its age is reaching about 50 years in average age. Um, bridges of that era were designed for a 50 year service life. Um, so while we are making progress, it's still an uphill climb. And on that topic, we did perform a semi-annual update to the poor bridge list and our program prioritization plan. This resulted in 11 newly eligible bridges. Um, this is in line with historic trends for context. We usually see about 15 to 25 bridges fall to poor condition per year. And then finally, I wanted to conclude my briefing by noting that we have completed efforts to bring the management of the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise Program in-house. Um, I look forward to introducing our new internal team to you over the coming months as we review enterprise initiatives with the board. And that concludes my briefing. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions for Patrick Holinda on the briefing for the quarter? Question. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, followed by Commissioner Beatty. Patrick, thank you for the report. Just a quick question on prioritization of, of bridges. Um, does it become a priority from a conditional perspective or is, is there a consideration region-wide or statewide for various regions? You see what I'm, I'm kind of getting at? So I can see yeah. if a bridge is failing, that's probably number one priority, but. Yes, absolutely. So when the program was stood up, uh, we really went to a prioritization model that looked at three primary factors. Um, so we're looking at safety, mobility, and economic factors for the structure. Uh, we take all the structures around the state, view them through the same lens in terms of a pool, and then prioritize them. Um, so in terms of how the program's operated, we're really looking at the bridges rather than the location of the bridges. That said, we do often arrive at a situation where you will have bridges of equivalent priority, right? And we don't have the funding to complete both of those. So regional equity would be something we'd take into account. Um, when selecting A versus B, if all other factors were equal for those structures. Thank you. Good, good answer. Yeah, um, I shared a picture of a bridge on I-70, uh, exit 322 with uh, chief engineer and maintenance and, and you, um, mm -hmm. and I got the feedback on it. I figured it was not down to the level of needing replaced, it, but um, it just highlight, highlighted to me seeing the, the spalling of the rebar and the concrete underneath from leaking joints. And it all comes back to not having enough preventative maintenance that we're spending on these structures that could have probably had another 20, 30 year life extended um, on these bridges or indefinitely if we had all the money we wanted for preventative maintenance. But um, I know there was some discussion about allowing the bridge and tunnel funds to be used somewhat for some preventative maintenance. Has that moved forward in being available or is that still restricted to just replacing structures? Yes, so there's, there's two components to that. Um, so there is a certain population of structures that we are able to use bridge and tunnel enterprise funds to maintain. Um, there's actually an IGA between the bridge and tunnel enterprise and CDOT that essentially as the enterprise replaces structures that then become assets of the enterprise and then we are then able to maintain those structures moving forward. So we do expect to come to you um, at a minimum within the year here with a plan for how we're going to maintain those new structures that we're putting online to get the maximum out of our investment. 
Um, in terms of the structures that are currently owned by CDOT, uh, those legislative proposals that we discussed uh, earlier this year are in consideration by the legislature, and I'd invite Herman to, to weigh in if he had any other uh, perspective on that, but that's my understanding at this time. I think that's right. Yeah. And it's just a challenge because we don't have enough money to replace the ones that are aging out that we have to replace. And, but it's just a comment more for the commission on our budgeting and how we, we try to extend the life of our assets. And I, I guess with maintenance and engineering, I guess, especially with the CDOT budget, looking at how we can try to increase some preventative maintenance. I don't know if they're ceiling and just some lower cost things that we could be doing. Um, just to the understructure. So if it does leak, we're not getting into the concrete. I don't know if there's options that way or things, but just trying to figure out how we can can slow this deterioration of some of our structures because obviously our bridges are one of the largest um, expenditures per project just to get them reconstructed now. So um, anything we can do within CDOT, I, I encourage you to do. And if there's requests for a study or anything, I'd ask you to bring those forward to the commission so we can maybe try to get a better plan developed um, if there's some funding needed for that sort of things. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? That was a great brief, Patrick. I have one uh, thought ahead. We're always comparing ourselves with Utah and Kansas. If we're a 50 year old average bridge, how are those states doing? And I, you don't have to answer now, but we need to be better than them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's always the goal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your report. We really appreciate your work. Thank you. Next, uh, let's go through the final fiscal year 2023 to 24 Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise Budget Allocation Plan. Jeff Sudmeyer. Um, so as we did with the CDOT budget, we are bringing back to you this month, the final proposed fiscal year 24 uh, bridge and tunnel enterprise budget. Um, we'll return next month uh, to request your approval. Uh, the final proposed fiscal year 24 bridge and tunnel enterprise budget totals 152.9 million with 109 million of that revenue attributed to the legacy faster bridge safety surcharge and 27.3 million to the new bridge and tunnel impact fee and retail delivery fee. Um, final adjustments have been made to align with the latest revenue forecast and to address final changes to staff salary and benefits and debt service. Um, the fiscal year 24 BTE budget allocates roughly 102 million to bridge and tunnel enterprise projects and 49 million to debt service. Uh, that includes a debt service on the outstanding 2010 Build America bonds, uh, as well as the BTE share of the Central 70 availability payments that we'll be paying going forward. Um, approximately 1.8 million is allocated to admin and operations, 825,000 to maintenance and 48,000 to supportive services. Um, unlike the CDOT budget, which we reviewed with you yesterday, we had a number of significant changes from the draft budget. Um, not so many significant changes here uh, from the budget that you already approved in draft form uh, in November. Um, so we'll bring this back to you for final approval next month and happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, just wanted to give you a quick briefing. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions or comments for Jeff? Quick question. Mark Garcia. Jeff, the, you alluded to this, but the uh, delivery fee, the retail delivery fee, are those revenue projections on track? And, and I would assume so based on our clean transit enterprise funds yep. that we're seeing as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I actually um, am probably a month behind in looking at where we're at, but I think as of about a month ago, for the uh, various fees, um, you know, we we did forecasts. Our forecasts are not monthly, so all I can really do is sort of prorate across the calendar, the the months in the year. But I think if you were just looking at uh, at um, you know five or six months of revenue compared to five or six um, uh, months of our forecast, we are somewhere between 105 and 110 percent of what the forecast was. So um, I would actually say not only is that positive from the perspective that that's more than we're forecast, but given how, um, uh, given the fact that there's no history on these fees, I, I'm also pretty impressed that our forecast actually came is is coming that close to actuals. Any other questions or comments for Jeff? Not, Go ahead. Not specifically for Jeff, but just to comment on to follow up on our bridge preventative maintenance. 
um, overall our maintenance on CDOT facilities is talking about greenhouse gas reductions that preventive maintenance reduces all that reconstruction stuff if we can maintain our facilities much longer and not have to fully reconstruct. So that's one of the considerations we need to be looking at on our preventative maintenance uh, system wide is the more we can prevent having to reconstruct, the more we reduce that greenhouse gas impact on those uh, replacements. So thank you. Thank you. One more question. If yes, I go mean, ahead, Commissioner Garcia. In line with my questioning yesterday on the budget, Jeff, uh, reserves or fund balance on this enterprise, where might we see those? I see a zero uh, budget here, but. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question, actually. In the case of the bridge and tunnel enterprise, um, we we have a little bit different way of operating. We do not have a set aside um, contingency or reserve fund in the same way that we do on the on the commission side. Um, I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that, but one is just simply I think the um, the the way that we sort of incrementally budget projects on, um, and bring to you on a monthly basis for the bridge and tunnel enterprise um, when we have situations that in the case of uh, a CDOT project might require us to go to con to uh, the commission for a contingency request or a, a program reserve request. Generally, we are just able to sort of incorporate those at a pro those increases at a project level as we bring them forward for your approval. So um, I, I could probably give you a more detailed explanation than that, but in the uh, to to be succinct, um, the simple answer is we don't maintain uh, a separate um, reserve or contingency balance specifically for the bridge and tunnel enterprise. So uh, following on, say our uh, retail fee generations higher as you reported, what, what happens with those excess funds then? Sure. So um, in the case of you know, both CDOT and the enterprises, um, we, we forecast revenues, we, we build our budget generally on the last forecast um, available prior to needing to finalize and approve it. Um, but then we, we do quarterly revenue forecasts and we monitor the budget over the course of the year. Um, if there is ever a, a significant deviation, um, we, we would then come back to you during the course of the, of the fiscal year and actually make a budget amendment to allocate additional funds or cut additional funds. Um, we only do that if it's a significant deviation. Otherwise, what we do is we, we reconcile revenue at the end of the fiscal year. So at the end of the fiscal year, we, we go through our revenue reconciliation process. We're, we're either over or under, um, and then we, we sort of make adjustments going forward. Other questions or comments for Jeff? I'd just like to thank you, Jeff, because for the visitors here, this used to be a bridge enterprise, but now it's a bridge and tunnel enterprise, and you and your staff and everyone have had to do a lot of work to get this under control, and now we're in a very solid position, and it's extremely important for the state, so thank you very much. Thank you. Any other matters to come before the bridge and tunnel enterprise? Hearing none, let's adjourn the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise for February and plunge into the main event. This is our successes from the CDOT inter internship and fellowship programs, Gary Vansuch. This is an exciting time and we wanted to make sure that all the commissioners heard some report outs from our interns and fellows. Thank you for coming today. Well, thank you, Chair Stanton. Uh, Chair Stanton, uh, Vice Chair Beatty, uh, commissioners, fellow Team C daughters, fellow Coloradans. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the successes of and some future plans for uh, the CDOT internship and fellowship programs. Um, my name is Gary Vansuch. Officially, I'm Director of Process Improvement here at CDOT. Unofficially, I'm the most fortunate person on the planet for many reasons. One of the reasons is I have had the wonderful opportunity over the past decade to work with the 77 people that you see in the right photo collage who have served as CDOT interns on my team in the Office of Process Improvement. Uh, again, I'm one of the most fortunate persons on the planet. Uh, today, you will hear from eight people that you see on the left who are current, uh, part of the, the core of current CDOT interns and fellows. Next. Last week, uh, the commission asked this question. How many current permanent CDOT employees were CDOT interns? 
Uh, I have to tell you, our data on this is imperfect. However, we do know that at least these 41 people who were former CDOT interns and fellows are now in permanent CDOT positions. Those 41 people. As the great Helen Hayes once noted, the expert at anything was once a beginner. The 41 people you see here were uh, listed here were CDOT interns, beginners, who are now the experts and emerging experts at CDOT that we all rely upon from all five regions as well as in our CDOT headquarters staffs. Next. Uh, in a little bit, we'll discuss some of the programmatic elements and initiatives of the internship and fellowship programs, and we'll certainly field your questions. To help frame all that, we are featuring eight of the current uh, core of CDOT interns and fellows from four different groups the Office of Process Improvement, the Division of Transportation Development, the Office of Innovative Mobility, and CDOT's uh, Denver Central Region, which we know is Region 1. First up are Riley Wiesler and Samantha Millison. Um, we're excited to share what we've been doing with the Transportation Commission, and we'll start with some quick introductions. So I'm Riley Wiesler. I graduated from Boise State this past May with a BA in Global Studies, a French minor in an elementary Mandarin certificate, and I've since submitted applications for political science doctoral programs, and I'm currently an intern with the Office of Process Improvement, and I'll hand it to Samantha. Hi, Transportation Commission. My name is Samantha Millison, and for a quick introduction about me, I was born and raised here in Denver, Colorado. I recently just graduated in December with a degree in mathematics, magna cum laude from University of Colorado Boulder. And like Riley, I am also an intern with the Office of Process Improvement. Back to you. Next slide, please. Uh, so one avenue that our office focuses on is business improvement and change management. So as OPI interns, we get to assist with the different change management projects and courses that our office produces by being both producers and participants. So as producers, we complete all the behind the scenes work. And then as participants, we get to engage with the courses and bring a business improvement project to work on. Uh, after completing the course, we receive our change practitioner certifications, which you'll see an example of up on the slide as well as screenshots from both Sam and I's cohorts. Um, and since both Sam and I have already completed the change management course, we wanted to discuss briefly the projects we brought to those courses. Next slide, please. So the project I brought is called Improving How We Improve. And some quick context on the project, the Quality Improvement Council, or QIC, is a joint venture between CDOT and the Federal Highway Administration. In each annual cycle, the QIC identifies high-risk areas and selects JPRs or joint process reviews accordingly. Um, and up until recently, the rate of successful completion for JPRs has been quite low for a variety of reasons. And as such, the goal of my project is to increase the likelihood of success on all current and future JPRs by creating standard processes, best practices, and ensuring the consistent use of these practices by the JPR leaders and the QIC as a whole. Um, thus far, we've had the Sponsor Coalition kickoff as well as the Project Team kickoff, and I'm excited to continue working on the project in the future. And now Sam will talk about her team. Thank you. And my change management project was titled Refining the Culture and Structure of the Division of Transit and Rail, also known as DTR. And through doing so, I plan to achieve the primary object objective of improving the overall workflow of the division. Um, however, I realized quickly that change relies heavily on the people side. So now I'm really focusing on the people in DTR. The efficiency and effectiveness of people is highly dependent upon how well they are equipped, supported, and welcomed from their very first day. So I'm now in the process of executing standard onboarding by implementing a 30, 60, 90 day onboarding plan with every new employee, as well as inspiring an intern buddy system for every new intern. Next slide, please. And in addition to our own change management projects, our office stays highly engaged with change management and business improvement through our Concept to Project initiative. Concept to Project, or C2P, was launched back in 2021, and the program is helping everyone at CDOT that is impacted by change to be successful with that change. The goal is to have a one-stop shop for project leaders and team members to have a robust list of services and tools. You can see the C2P website by scanning the QR code that's on the slide, which was implemented in 2022. Next slide, please. And as interns, we also help to publish business improvement projects on our C2P dashboard. 
Um, there are currently 106 published CDOT projects and over 100 still need to be entered. Back in late fall of 2022, we only had 87 projects in our database. So it has certainly expanded since then and continues to grow. And I'll now let Riley talk about another initiative of our office. Thank you. So beyond C2P, we also have our Lean Everyday Ideas program or LEI. And this program encourages employees to identify opportunities to make improvements in the workplace and also to replicate these improvements once they're implemented. So there are a couple of ways we go about accomplishing this goal. We always start by meeting with the innovators um, and gathering information about their ideas. Sometimes we record the interview with them as part of our Spotlight on Innovation series, and then we post this video interview to our website. And finally, we create idea cards, which you can see an example of on the slide. Um, these are essentially a snapshot of the innovation and are published on our dashboard and are public facing. And an outcome of our successful LEI program has been the Innovation Challenge, which I'll briefly highlight on the next slide. So I'm the current project lead for the 2023 Innovations Challenge. And as many of you are likely familiar with, if you attended December session, uh, this project has- You really need to speak better into the mic. We just can't hear Hi. you. Get closer <laughs> to the mic and pull it into your faces. You have wonderful things to say, and we just can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm the project lead for the 2023 Innovations Challenge, and it was launched in December during the last TC session. And the submission period is open now until June 30th. We take every opportunity to advertise this program. So I encourage all of you to visit our website if you want to learn more. And now I'll pass it to Maya. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Adams. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair. <clears throat> I was fortunate to uh, be able to listen to the interns report out last week. So I'm going to drop from the call, but before doing so, I just wanna say for the benefit of the other commissioners, and I know all of you will come to this conclusion on your own. I, I just think, and I shared this with everyone last week, <clears throat> the report outs were outstanding to me. Every single intern that we have, uh, you know, are, are fortunate enough to have joined CDOT, they make such valuable, real contributions in the work that they do. And I do think that, uh, and I'm delighted that they're able to come before the commission today and share the, the, the results of the work that they did. And hopefully when their time at their institutions or learning are done, and they're looking for places where they might pursue their future career, that they'll look to CDOT as a place that, uh, that they might consider. But uh, I wanna thank them all for all the contributions that they've made to CDOT and to the citizens of Colorado. So thanks to all of you once again. Thanks very much, uh, Commissioner Adams. Okay, let's go ahead. Hello, my name is Maya Quigley, and I would like to start this presentation off by saying how grateful I am for the opportunity for professional development here at CDOT and for this opportunity to speak in front of the Transportation Commission. Recently, I graduated summa cum laude from Regis University with my bachelor's degree in communications and an emphasis in public relations. Currently, I am working towards my master's degree in business administration and playing my fifth and final year of NCAA eligibility at the Regis University women's lacrosse team on a nationally ranked program. As the region one internal communications and events intern, my position came about after a region wide employee survey, citing the need for more employee recognition and connection, especially after COVID left many people feeling very isolated. Not long after I started, region one held an employee barbecue, which I helped carry out. This was the first time in several years that our fellow team members from across the region were able to come together for an event like this. We took a region one group photo, which is the top picture on the slide. And at the region one barbecue, and even through the planning process, I was able to see how events like this strengthen the connections between employees here at CDOT and help us really function as a cohesive team. I also assist with external events when needed. And in the bottom photo, I'm at the I-70 Floyd Hill groundbreaking event with members of the communications team and Governor Polis. I served as a support role and day of coordination at this important media event. 
Next slide, please. As a part of the Region 1 communications team, I work under Tamara Rollison and Presley Fowler. I have been fortunate enough to glean a ton of information from them as they're both incredibly knowledgeable and they are such a large part of keeping Region 1 moving smoothly. As their intern, I help plan and manage internal communications and events, different social media campaigns that I've been assigned to, and facilitate meetings with different students who are doing a school project involving CDOT. For example, recently I've been working with a student who is producing a video for Rocky Mountain PBS about snowplow operators and how they're the unsung heroes of Colorado. In the photo on the right, I am pictured with Presley Fowler at my very first site visit at the I-70 over Harlan Street Bridge Replacement Project, where I captured photos and videos that were then turned into a project update that was shared on various CDOT social media channels. In the photo on the left, I'm pictured with Tamara Rollison and Presley at the Region 1 holiday party that I planned, and this event helped bring people together with a very competitive baking competition and lots of holiday cheer. One of the highlights of my internship is getting to manage the Eisenhower Tunnel 50th birthday social media campaign, where I was lucky enough to learn about the extreme engineering feat that it was. And throughout that project, I learned about Janet Bonima, the first female engineer technician hired by CDOT and a trailblazer for women in the transportation industry. Another highlight was getting to plan the, um, <clears throat> the Veterans Day appreciation event where we got to honor the service and sacrifice of the veterans who now work here at CDOT and have continued to serve the public in a new way. Next slide, please. Some of my key takeaways from my internship thus far include the need for employee recognition, such as appreciation events. I've also learned a lot about accessibility and the importance of that and the different social media campaigns that I've been managing, direct and transparent communication, and the importance of having a high-performing safety culture. I continue to be impressed by the people here at CDOT and their dedication to the traveling public. Thank you again for your time, and I'm going to pass it on to Jenny Kearns from the Division of Transportation Development. Hello, thanks for having us today. My name is Jenny Kearns and I'm an intern with the Landscape Architecture Department here at headquarters. I'm also a full-time student at MSU Denver where I'm studying environmental engineering and GIS. I've worked on a variety of projects during my time here, including an interactive seed mix tool to support revegetation along CDOT right-of-ways, as well as uh, novel research into living snow fence designs. But what I want to talk to you about today is a project that I got to jump into shortly after beginning my internship here last May. I joined my coworkers Leah Koyevhaus from headquarters and Veronica McCall from Region 1 in developing a GIS process that went on to win the People's Choice Award for the 2022 CDOT Innovations Challenge. To better understand what we were working on, it's important to know that some projects require a NEPA clearance called a visual impact assessment. And as part of this assessment, a GIS process called a viewshed analysis is sometimes utilized. And this allows us to see where a project can be viewed from and how new structures or changed infrastructure might impact existing views. You can see one method for doing this on the slide. We can place points along a road at driver height and this mimics the views that a driver will have while traveling. Next slide, please. Uh, many past visual impact assessments use Google Maps and site visits to determine the project viewshed, but using a GIS analysis is becoming more common and improves the efficiency of the process. Typical viewsheds use a digital elevation model or DEM, which you can see just uses the natural elevation with that red line. So for running a viewshed from the point of this person walking, the result would show that she has a full view of the mountains in the distance. So my team developed a process for viewshed analysis that uses LIDAR based digital surface models, which account for vegetation and structures. So using the DSM, if we're running a viewshed, you can see it takes into account the houses and the vegetation, and it would show that this person's view of the mountains is mostly blocked, which is accurate to reality. Next slide, please. So here are some maps that I made for projects that are examples of how we apply this process to, uh, to projects here at CDOT. Uh, on the left is a map of the project viewshed 
for the proposed climbing lane between the Bakerville exit and the Eisenhower, tu Eisenhower Tunnel on westbound I-70. Since we have a more accurate idea of the viewshed boundary, we can narrow our focus to what will be impacted within that boundary. On the right, you can see a map that was produced to evaluate the impact that the proposed wildlife overpass near Greenland, Colorado will have on views of Greenland Ranch. We're still perfecting this process and we're excited to see it used on future projects. Thank you for your time. I'm gonna pass this over to my friend, Mike Prado. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Mike Prado. I am the headquarters permanent water quality intern working in the Division of Transportation Development. I graduated from MSU Denver in the spring of 2022 with a bachelor's degree in environmental science and I started my internship in June. I've also worked on a wide variety of projects over the course of my internship. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. I have worked on various mapping projects, including this basin percent map. I created this map to determine how much area and how many lane miles each watershed basin has within our water quality boundary. This data will be used to help manage stormwater within each basin. Go ahead and press enter, please. I have also helped conduct annual inspections on our permanent water quality control measures. I was tasked with generating these reports, adding maps and providing quality assurance. I worked with our GIS team to streamline this process to reduce the number of manual edits needed. And in 2022, we inspected 338 of our control measures. So the improvements made in this process really added up to a lot of time saved. Uh, go ahead and press enter again. I've also had the pleasure of working with various stormwater management organizations and attending public education and outreach events. Um, here you can see a picture of the grand opening of the CSU Spur Campus Hydro Building, which we attended. We got to hear the governor and the mayor speak at that event, and it's a really cool building if you haven't checked it out already. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the highlight of my internship has been working with MSU Denver on an infiltration study. The purpose of this study is to determine the effectiveness of subsoiling as a maintenance procedure to restore infiltration rates within swales. Swales are designed to capture and treat stormwater runoff from our highways. So stormwater would flow off of a highway down a slide slope and enter the main channel of a swale where it'll remove roadway pollutants of concern which are set forth by our MS4 permit. Um, over time, sediment will build up within the swale and reduces that infiltration rate. And subsoiling is an agricultural practice which restores infiltration rates. Um, so here you can see one of our roadside swales, and this was before we subsoiled it. And go ahead and press enter. And here's what it looked like afterwards. So we basically attached the subsoiler back on the end of a tractor, and we drag that across the uh, the swale area and we backfill that with more of the filtration media which helps remove those pollutants of concern. And so students conducted infiltrometer tests to measure infiltration rates both before and after subsoiling and we found a 55 percent increase in infiltration rate from before to after subsoiling. So we we're really pleased with these preliminary results and we would like to continue to study this further. Um, go ahead and press enter. You can see some students here from MSU Denver conducting these infiltrometer tests. Um, we go ahead and press enter one more time. And I would like to end with this. So sometimes when we're going through our daily grind, we lose sight of the big picture of why we do the work we do. We had a great reminder of this one day while working on the swale. We were walking down and we noticed a Western tiger salamander, which happens to be our state amphibian. The salamander got spooked and was trying to cross the highway. So to avoid a possible disaster, we scooped it up and released it into the nearby Cherry Creek. Sammy the Salamander became our mascot for this project and served as a reminder of our goal to protect water quality for aquatic species and all uses of water. Uh, once again, my name is Mike Prado. I've really enjoyed my internship here at CDOT and seeing how CDOT provides access to the great outdoors while also upholding environmental standards. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Commissioner Vasquez. Can you detail a little more what subsoiling involves? We could see in the image that there's disruption, but I don't know what material you're using. Yeah, so subsoiling is a minimal tillage agricultural practice. So instead of going through it with a traditional tiller, the subsoiler has a series of shanks which penetrate down to a compacted layer and break that up with dis without disturbing top vegetation. 
Now, why that is important and why it helps with infiltration rates is it leaves that vegetation undisturbed and leaves those roots undisturbed, which help increase porosity within the soil and help increase infiltration rates. Typical maintenance procedures of swales require bringing in uh, excavation equipment and removing the top three inches or so of that infiltration media. And then that area will likely have to be reseeded. And so this process will hopefully prevent that cake layer from initially forming and extend the life of these uh, of these swales. So you're just breaking up the compacted soil beneath. Yeah, so all the sediment from the road kind of gets into that infiltration media and will slowly filter down and then it kind of creates a compacted layer. Um, we measured our compacted layer to be about 10 inches down. And so we set the subsoiler shanks to penetrate down just below that and that helps break up that compacted layer. And then we came through and filled in with new infiltration media within those trenches. And this came from a study from the Minnesota uh, Department of Transportation that we tried to uh, replicate to see if we can get similar results. Thanks for the detail. Yep. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Up next, we have Ruth Kadima. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning, commissioners. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak before you and to talk a little bit about what I do here at CDOT. Um, just before I begin, just a little bit about me. I am a fellow at the Division of Transit and Rail. Um, I hold a BA in Economics and Political Science. I am currently a graduate student at the University of Denver pursuing my master's degree in Economics and Social Policy. Um, and I aspire to one day work for the CDC or the WHO um, in healthcare policy to create a more effective and accessible healthcare system in the US. Next slide, please. Thank you. So one of my main responsibilities at the moment is working on the state management plan. Um, the state management plan is an FTA approved uh, document that outlines C CDOT's um, processes or administration of 5310 5311 and 5339 um, programs. One of my latest tasks was to create a spreadsheet of all the graphics and flow charts that we currently have in our SMP. Um, that way we're aware of the information we currently have, what areas need more modification or revision, um, and what information can be condensed so that it's um, more comprehensive and more digestible um, for the public. Something that I do on the daily are reimbursement requests. So here at, at CDOT, state and federal funds are dispersed on a reimbursement basis, um, meaning recipients incur costs and CDOT then uh, reimburse those costs on a monthly basis. My job is to review the documentation that um, the recipients upload that confirm those costs and either reject or approve the reimbursement request. Um, rejecting it sends it back to the recipient for revision and approving it sends it to second, second approvals and to our very last approval stage done by our business office. And something that I'm very eager to start is planning um, transit town hall meetings. Um, some of my responsibilities will include obviously organizing the events, uh, taking meeting notes, ensuring that all of our attendees um, are able to access the event, whether virtually or in person, um, and helping in the creation of the agenda. I'm super excited to start doing this because it's not only a great way for DTR um, to provide updates to the public, but it's a great way for us to get that face-to-face -face interaction with um, members of the community that we all strive to serve. And I think that's my favorite part of this job. So thank you all again for your time. And next up is presenter, Krista Pitts. All right, thank you, Ruth. And good morning, commissioners. My name is Krista, and I'm currently completing my master's degree in geography at the University of Denver. Um, my main research interests include urban transportation planning, uh, sustainability, and GIS. And I wanted to use my time today to talk about a few maps that I've worked on during my internship at CDOT. So this first one might be uh, pretty familiar to you. Um, this map shows the current highway coverage for DC fast chargers in Colorado. So now I certainly can't take credit for the design choices that went on for these maps, but one of my duties has been to update the map every month. 
And while it's a relatively small portion of my work, I find it incredibly satisfying to see the, the percentages go up a little by little every month. Um, and knowing that I have a role to play in marketing materials that are uh, shared really widely. Uh, next slide, please. So related to our DC fast charging uh, initiative, my second uh, map here is a screenshot of a web tool that I worked on recently with the help of Nate Rogers, Sina Zen, and Mike King. So the purpose of this tool is to allow potential NEVI grantees to see where there is a need in the state based on whether that stretch of highway is within 25 miles of a, a NEVI compliant charger. And it also shows areas in blue where they would receive an enhanced initiative for building a charging station there. Um, stakeholders can plug in an address of where they'd like to build a station and see whether or not it qualifies for extra funding on their NEVI grant. Um, you can see here an address that I plugged in. I don't know if you can see where the little dot is on the on the map, but unfortunately, it's just outside our enhanced initiatives area. So maybe this potential applicant could um, decide to change their plans uh, before they apply for a grant. Um, this tool is now publicly available on CDOT's NEVI website, and the individual layers can also be downloaded by stakeholders for their own analyses. Uh, next slide, please. So my final map looks very different here, um, partially because I wanted to highlight how we use different maps differently, um, and partially because I wanted to end on an exciting note and what is more exciting than database management. Um, this map is looking at the current land uses along um, the proposed front range passenger rail alignments. So what we wanna do is understand the current landscape and how construction and operation of a passenger rail line would affect the surrounding areas. Uh, my role has been to collect data from all those sources there on the, on the uh, left, wait, right? Um, combine it into a single layer um, with that attribute table along the bottom and then convert it to, to um, convert each uh, source's zoning information into generalizable categories I have shown there in the middle. So before my internship ends, this will become usable data showing a snapshot of what obstacles, both like geographic and political that we're going to have to face during construction, um, depending on which alignment we choose. So I hope you've enjoyed this mapping minute with me. Um, I appreciate your time this afternoon uh, or this morning commissioners. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ken Bizon. A uh, question from Commissioner Garcia. On that one map you had about the um, the charging stations and the gaps. Yes. So with the, the latest change or news from Tesla, how how do you think that map's going to change for NEVI compliance? That That is a great question, and we are talking about that a lot. So maybe not in the next month. I think maybe in the next coming months, we're definitely going to be looking into adding Tesla because currently this map specifically excludes Tesla because they're not public, um, publicly available. They're only available to, to Tesla owners. So Tesla has approved, I believe, that their, their charging stations will be allowed to um, be universal. But I think that there's, there's like funding approved for that, but I'm not sure if they're actually going to be like upgraded, it depends on the timeline of like actually upgrading those stations, but we are looking forward to being able to add those to this map. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Vasquez. At least what I read in the public uh, facing media from Tesla is that it's not till 2024. And as you said, it depends on their timeline for actually making the software and hardware changes on those chargers, right? Yeah, exactly. So we are, we're, we're keeping our eyes on it, um, listening to those updates, but hopefully, because our goal is to have 80% coverage by the, I think it's the end of this fiscal year, maybe June or July. And so if we could get those Tesla chargers up and running by then, I'm sure that would be a big boon. But, you. you know, who knows? Hello, Chair Stanton, Chair Beattie, and members of the Florida Transportation Commission. To prepare for the future, I think we should use traditional and emerging technologies to help combat congestion and pollution. My name is Ken Dizon, and I'm part of the Office of Innovative Mobility, led by Kate Kelly. Our team at CDOT focuses on electric vehicles, mobility services, transit and rail, and currently, my seven-month fellowship within mobility technology, who is led by Ashley Nyland, who is now part of USDOT. 
I'm fortunate enough to apply my data science background to jumpstart technology as tools to build safe and efficient roadways. With these values in mind, I'd like to share the connected vehicle projects and transport demand management projects that I've been a part of. Next slide, please. So for connected vehicles, I want to give a high level overview. Connected vehicles, also known as CVs, are classified as vehicles that are equipped with technology, the physical component, such as that box on the top right, um, to help send information such as speed, direction, braking, and hopefully when or when you don't use your turn signals. The current functionalities of our CV program has been an implementation of 100 onboard units in CDOT fleet vehicles, with 50 more coming, and 120 RSUs, known as roadside units, located on I-70, I-25, and Wadsworth Boulevard, with an additional 300 deployments um, coming within the end of the year. The software components of these hardware technologies are for validating messages that hopefully we can use for end goals to provide information on harsh braking on I-25 roadways, um, on I-70 uh, I roadways, sorry, I-25 for transit, trans, transport signal priority for snow plows, and on Wadsworth Boulevard for real-time weather events. Pairing for these advanced technologies is just right around the bend. And I think I've really put my skills to the test and these problems and opportunities have arised. As my professor once said, these aren't just problems, Ken. These are opportunities. And fortunately for me, I get these opportunities more and more each day. Next slide, please. <laughs> the third component has been my research on transport demand management. And I think the first part was asking myself, would you consider CDOT a data-driven organization? Let's be realistic and relevant here. I think we should consider the success of our current and future projects, such as calculating greenhouse gas emissions, transport demand management, and roadway planning within the mix. Secondly, to make sure these considerations are successful, CDOT has acquired two software as a service platforms, Streetlight Data and Ride Report, where we can use metrics and create KPIs for demographics and mobility use. Thirdly, CDOT's investment in these software as a service platforms, we've, which we have done annually, is our, uh, to improve data literacy and organizational access across the board. For these, we should use data to guide decision-making within the organization. Thank you for your time and my, fellow, fellow, uh, my fellows and interns for sharing their gifts today. Thank you for listening. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you for your presentation. Quick question on that one slide you had about the hardware deployments. I think there were 600 there. What do you feel the climate is about more technology in our communities? And I went through an experience where uh, electric cooperative was deploying automatic meter uh, antennas. There's a lot of community pushback. So I'm just curious if you're getting any feedback on the, on the hardware deployment that you're working on with CVs. Yeah, so these hardware deployments on CVs, I, I personally haven't um, known of any pushback from them yet, uh, just because we're still in rolling out those phases. Uh, as you mentioned, 600 is the total goal um, combined overuse uh, onboard units and roadside units. So far, they're on public roads uh, and those main arterials, um, such as, you know, Wadsworth, I-70 and I-25, as you mentioned. So yeah. is any of that on private property or it's all on right of it's on roads. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Uh, next, Jennifer. Uh, you've heard some of why I'm the most fortunate person on the planet. I get to work with these folks every single day. Um, and right, one more, right there. Uh, that's okay. Uh, you know, during the first decade of great interns, uh, we've had many terrific people who've made wonderful contributions at the beginning of their careers to help us run the Colorado transportation system. And uh, you've seen some of the ones I've worked with in the past, you know, some of the folks, the 41 folks that now have permanent CDOT positions, uh, as well as eight of our current folks, the beginners who are going to become the experts of tomorrow. Next. And even at the beginning of their careers, these people have been winning awards for their work. One of our industry groups, the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, or ARPA, 
through its uh, Women's Leader Awards program, has recognized three Team C dollars with the Future Industry Spotlight Award. Those interns, who by the way, were also simultaneously college students, are Laura Parsons from 2017, Megan Brown from 2018, and Victoria Farberall from 2021. Next. And four CDOT interns have been recognized on the annual national top 100 uh, intern list too. Uh, you've seen Victoria already, uh, along with her colleagues, uh, Jacob DeSalvo and Kelly Hansen in 2021 and Courtney Osborne in 2022. Next. And for the second decade of great interns, you know, which we, we uh, date starting from last no November, CDOT will be first continuing to engage people as interns, folks like you heard today and, and fellows who are current college students, along with people who have graduated from college during the past three years. We're also working with Dana Bustamante and other people at the Colorado Department of Human Services to bring on some Colorado Refugee Service Program participants as interns. Third, we're also working to bring on some cadets from the Air Force Academy. They don't typically get to have internships, but they do get the summer off and we're working to bring on some interns from the Air Academy, uh, potentially even this summer. And we are working with our good friends and colleagues at the Colorado Department of Public Safety on another exciting opportunity. Jennifer, next. To briefly discuss this, we have on hand Corey Niemeyer, the, the CDPS Director of Operational Excellence, and Kevin Rance, the CDPS Chief Administrative Officer, both of whom are shown in this photo with somebody else you might know, Governor Polis. Uh, so Corey and Kevin, please. Yeah. Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk briefly about SkillBridge. Um, I'm Kevin Rance. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for uh, the Department of Public Safety. Um, but prior to that, for 21 years, I served in the United States Army and I retired in 2015. So as a veteran, uh, this program to me means a lot. Uh, what DOD SkillBridge is, is a, uh, it's a program that allows uh, honorably uh, serving members of the military who are transitioning out, whether they be at the end of their initial enlistment, right, so the expiration of the term of their service, or at the end of a career, uh, a retiree, that allows them to serve the, the uh, remaining four or six months of, of their service uh, in an internship capacity for a DOD SkillBridge employer. Um, we were the first state agency in the, uh, in the state to, to become a SkillBridge employer. And we actually came across this by accident one day and I had a, uh, an opening and a retiring Marine Corps officer called me and, and was inquiring about the opening. I said, well, you're not qualified really for the, for the position that you're looking for. And we started chatting and he's like, well, what do you know about SkillBridge? And I said, I don't know anything about it. And uh, so we made a deal. I said, I'll bring you on as an intern if you want to help us get that program up and running. And that was the summer of July of 21. So it's a very new program. Um, we thought we would be able to handle about four or six interns. Um, we worked on a little bit of a program with, with Corey and, and some of our human resources folks. And uh, six, eight months into it, we had over 90, right? And so it's, it's been an amazing uh, opportunity. We've placed quite a few interns from the program as well. Um, but it's something I'm very excited about. The Department of Public Safety has over 200 interns, uh, not interns, veterans. It's about 10% of our organization. I'm one of them. Um, but it's, it's quite an honor for me to be the executive uh, sponsor of this program as well. And I'm going to Turned over to Corey, he's our Operational Excellence Director, to kind of talk about what do we get uh, out of the SkillBridge program. Thank you, Kevin. Next slide, Jen. Thank you. So some of the benefits to public safety, these employees or potential employees are coming to us with some of the cases, 20 years of, of leadership experience. Um, they're anything from heavy mechanics, um, heavy equipment mechanics who go and work in our shops, to human resource um, specialists on the military side that can kind of come in and slide right into an internship and work on a special project or fill a gap that we may have in the department. So it's also a great pipeline for us. Um, we have lots of vacancies. We're growing as a department. So we need additional pipelines to bring in these skilled candidates into our agency. It is no cost to public safety to bring these folks in. They are 100% paid for by the Department of Defense 
So they come in basically for free. It's just our time to integrate them into their positions. Some of the benefits that they get, it helps smooth their transition into their civilian lives. Some of these folks have been in the military for 20 plus years. So having a, an agency to kind of bring them in and help them transition into their civilian life can mean the world to them. They also get experience working in the state system to decide is the state government a place that I want to call home for the next X amount of years. So it kind of gives them a little taste of what public safety is and hopefully inspires them to apply for some of our positions. They also receive a wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful mentor like Kevin Grants here. Um, Kevin essentially will mentor some of these employees as they come in, not only in their internship, but also in their life skills, giving them you know, his point of view, his um, perspective on his experience coming from military life and transitioning into civilian life. So it goes above and beyond um, just their work careers, but helping them transition kind of how they think about the world coming from military and moving into that civilian role. Um, that is what we wanted to kind of share with you all. And we were happy to field any questions that you may have for us. Any questions? Commissioners, anybody on Zoom? Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Just a quick question on uh, public safety within local governments. Do you, are you working on placement there? I know a lot of departments are running deficits, have vacancies. I don't know if this transitions into that opportunity or not. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Garcia. That's a very good question. So I'm gonna take a step back and talk about the other areas where we are starting to collaborate with the governor's office on particular initiatives. So uh, much like myself, we have a, a recently retired veteran that works in the governor's office and operations, uh, ben, ben Nichols. And through that process, we have uh, realized that there are some capability gaps that um, the state can work on some policy level decisions related to things such as post-credentialing and reciprocity for our security forces or military police that are transitioning out. And so we're working on some um, potential uh, legislation that would help the post board be able to um, give that reciprocity, uh, partnering with the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs on that. Um, so yeah, very good question. Uh, that is a talent pool. I mean, you guys are familiar with Colorado. It's a, a very military rich environment. Uh, we have interns um, all the way up as far north as from F.E. Warren. Um, and obviously for the Skill Bridge program, they come from all over, right? So sometimes we are a uh, very attractive uh, option because Colorado is where they call home, right? And so we have veterans that move here. Uh, we recently, in the photo that we had, there were, was a veteran that moved here from Okinawa uh, at the end of his Marine Corps service and because Colorado is home for him. So it's a nice option. We're not just recruiting from, um, you know, Buckley or Fort Carson or uh, Shine Mountain or some of the other installations here but uh, because because of fam familial ties or, or uh, family type uh, callings right uh, we, we're attracting from all over the country mm -hmm. and, uh, but very very good question it's it's something we're working on uh, it is helpful to have other veterans like myself in other places because they they understand the challenge as well um, we're working on also this is where the power of relationships comes in. So the chief of police for the, the city of Fountain is a military friend of mine. Uh, we served together, he went to high school with my wife. And he's one of our local advocates for helping uh, recruit because of where he is right next to Fort Carson and being a former military, military policeman himself. So we have a, a pretty good coalition working on, on some of those efforts. Commissioner Vasquez. Can you speak perhaps to uh, whatever Skillbridge is bringing to CDOT as potential interns? Yep, I'll turn out over here. Uh, th thank you, Commissioner Vasquez. Uh, we're learning from, um, uh, from CDPS. Uh, uh, Corey is my counterpart at uh, CDPS, uh, has brought this up for our statewide group where we get together the directors of process improvement uh, across uh, all the state agencies. Uh, when he brought it up, we said, of course, we want to do this. Uh, and we're learning from him and some of the other folks about the various forms. Uh, the military, by the way, is very particular about this. They don't just let anybody 
bring on skilled bridge interns. You have to have a plan. You have to have good mentors, uh, and you have to prove it. So we're in the process of putting together that paperwork. Again, learning from uh, Corey and Kevin and our good friends at uh, CDPS. Uh, again, it's, it's pretty exciting for us. We're going to be bringing on other kinds of uh, folks as interns, including I'm hopeful that uh, here in 2023, we can bring some folks into this room uh, who are, will be the first uh, Skillbridge interns uh, you know, uh, here at CDOT. Uh, for folks, uh, you know, Kevin has been uh, counseling us. It's great to have uh, executive sponsors that have military background. Uh, as you as you know, uh, John Moore May uh, has that military background and has offered to be a part of that when we get to that process. Uh, so again, uh, thank you, John. Uh, and we'll be pulling in some other folks uh, that have military backgrounds uh, to help us with that. Excuse me, but I believe uh, Mr. Lomay has reported to us it, his interest in this kind of internship program in the past. And I didn't know that it wasn't yet running. So this is interesting and very interested to hear your experience in, in public safety uh, exercising this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. So our experience, uh, I, I related, we, we find ourselves in Skillbridge by accident, right? But it's been a, it's an amazing um, opportunity for us to kind of learn how to run a large scale intern program um, and to do it in a way that is helpful to the veteran. One of the things that I, I want to ensure that we do as our veterans is not pigeonhole them into uh, what they did in the military, but provide that opportunity for them to explore. Um, sometimes those interests and ideas align with what they did in the military. Sometimes they don't. Um, but where we started to see some uh, potential gaps in our ability to place an intern was with what they were interested in. And it might be something more related to public health or engineering or skills that we don't necessarily have in the Department of Public Safety. But furthermore, as the only state agency that was enrolled in the program, um, we couldn't offer all of them what they were uh, really needing from a management perspective because everyone, that, everyone that's involved in the program has a day job, right? And so we want to be able to provide them a broader range of skill sets that they're looking for. So if they are interested in public policy or health or things like that, we could put them in HICPUF or we could put them in uh, the Department of Human Services or the Department of Transportation. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that was the biggest takeaway is that uh, this program will be better for the state of Colorado if we can open up the aperture a little bit. And so those veterans who want to come back to Colorado and call Colorado home have an opportunity that's not just limited by the, uh, the six divisions and the skill sets that we have resident in public safety. Yeah. Kevin, you mentioned uh, public health. I'll give you a contact over at CDPHE who's the head of uh, EMS emergency services, Donnie Woodyard. I'll do that afterwards All right, to help you. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Jennifer. Really? All right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Thank you. That's what we wanted to put in front of you. Uh, commissioners, that's what we wanted to put in front of you. Uh, you know, where we've been, uh, some of the successes we've had, eight terrific representatives of the current core of CDOT interns and fellows. Uh, we're open to your other questions uh, for any of the folks here. By the way, we also have uh, uh, virtually online our friends from the Talent Acquisition staff in the uh, Division of Human Resources. Are there additional questions? Yeah, just on the one program, the ViewShed one, uh, we had a presentation on that previously, and I'd mentioned about using that uh, technology to look at um, safety view so they can see you know vehicles coming or going whatever um just what raised it again coming out of loveland uh with the snow last night going around roundabouts and they have medians that have vegetation that's going to be growing up to where then you can't see what's coming around the roundabout it's like those are things that these design standards this view shed and, and looking at how vegetation may change over time and making sure that we don't put things in roundabouts that can start restricting views or you know just intersections or curves whatever trying to improve the safety using that technology and looking ahead what may happen with landscaping or 
just the way things are designed for that view from the vehicles themselves. So just an idea of how to improve this program for the safety aspect that we're always trying to strive and improve. For the state. Yeah, just a comment on that. I think it's for the visual impact assessments. A lot of times it's easy for people to think they're a lot of lower priority because, you know, it's a view. Views in Colorado are great. Um, but yeah, there's so many applications for safety and, and other things. And I think that's why also my department, the landscape architecture, it's important why we're like partnering with developing this program because uh, the people that I work with know about the vegetation and the appropriate plants and, and things like their growth rates and can inform that for maintenance and so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Beatty. Uh, other questions, comments from uh, uh, from the commission? Anybody on like Zoom? Uh, Kathy Hall, Commissioner. Yeah, I would just say this has really, really been interesting, and I've really enjoyed it. And I appreciate you bringing the interns to us and let us hear what they've been doing. And and really, this whole program has been really educational and interesting, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and Jennifer, and then Commissioner Garcia. Great. Commissioner and I would Garcia. just echo that. Keep up the great work. Thanks for presenting to us today. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. We're adjourned.